right, so that was super loud in my headphones just now. For those of you that were at the game, are your ears ringing? Have you recovered? I mean, my goodness. Incredible atmosphere, man. That clip is going viral right now. It was on the Pat McAfee show. It's been circling around social media. We've always been there. You just haven't been watching. And to be fair, we really haven't given you a great reason to watch us consistently and with any kind of expectations or really respect. But that might just be changing. What an evening that was. What a showcase of Aggie football, the 12th man, the university, at the largest possible stage of the sport outside of postseason stuff. I mean, how many years have we been fighting and telling people exactly what we are, what this place is, what this place can be with the right guy? Guys, it seems like we have the right guy. Seven wins in a row and a hell of a lot to play for going into November. Your next game is a November game. You've survived, not only survived, but improved and excelled into November. These are uncharted grounds, at least for me, over the last 15 or so years. I mean, we're turning a corner right now before our very eyes. It will not be easy. It's like we talked about. We've talked about this several times. The team has a big target on their back now. You have to navigate expectations now. You have to navigate rat poison, all of that stuff. And a team like South Carolina would like nothing more than to use a team like Texas A&M who just got showcased to that level that we just watched here, use them as a springboard into a strong finish to what's a pretty promising season so far for them. Guys, thank you for being here. I'm excited to talk to you after such a feel-good evening, man. I mean, are you guys still reveling in it? Are you guys still going back and watching and re-watching and re-watching again all your favorite plays? The second half, really. Marcel Reed, BJ Mays. It was just such a good time, man, and it just puts us all in a really, really good mood going forward. And, you know, you can't stop now. You got to keep pushing. We talked about that as a game that would show us where we really are. And this is where we really are. This is how it really is right now. But it's about the next step. Can you believe we're already eight games into the year? It went by like that. Time goes by fast when you're having fun. What is it? Time flies when you're having fun. That's the phrase, right? Next game's in freaking November. And what's even crazier than that, and I'm not saying I predict this or even that this scenario is likely. It's not very likely. You've played eight games. You could potentially play up to nine more games on the schedule. I'll break it down for you. Hypothetical. I'm just saying it's insane that this is on the table. I'm not saying it's going to happen. You could lose in the SEC championship. Well, you could finish the season. Four more games. That's 12. You could lose in the SEC championship. You could win the round of 12. You could win the round of eight. You could win the round of four. And then you could win the round, you know, you could get to the championship game. That's nine more games. That's just crazy. It's just a crazy fact, but it's even more crazy that we're already so far into the year. I'm just glad we have Tommy Moffat on our side in case a situation like that arises. Guys, thanks again for being here. The call-in link is pinned in the chat. We're going to go through a couple talking points. Then we'll get into calls at the end of the show. It won't be too long, maybe 20, 30 minutes. Then we'll get into calls. Click that link. You'll be prompted to enter a waiting room. I'll pull you guys in one by one to talk football. I, we're really in transition phase. This show, the early week show, is really kind of talking about the team as a whole, where it stands coming out of the previous week of games, kind of projecting it forward. So when you call in, I kind of want to hear how you feel about the team right now. Next show, I think it's going to be on Thursday. I think Thursday's Halloween, though. It might be. So I'll keep you updated. Most likely Thursday. Worst case scenario, we'll go Friday. We'll talk hardcore South Carolina that day. We're going to talk a little bit of South Carolina today, but I really want to talk about the team. I want to get back into the Marcel reed Connor Wigman discussion. I want to show some of my favorite plays from the game and talk about a couple talking points that have kind of, you know, been circulated around coming out of the game. Maybe people saying LSU blew that game and a and really wasn't the one that took it. I call bullshit. Talk a little bit about that. Just kind of get back into that now that we've had a couple days to sit on it. And, of course, we'll get into South Carolina and the calls later in the show. Like and subscribe, guys. We're going to keep doing this. I appreciate all of you. Let's see who's here today. I see a bunch of familiar faces, starting with Jeb, Jay Wynn, Noble guy. Noble says, are y'all still thinking about the winner? Have y'all moved on yet? Look, I'm still thinking about it, but I'm also very nervous about this game coming up. And as much as we can revel in it, as much as we can enjoy the feelings of that win, it's very important that the team moves on. That's the next big challenge for this team. And, you know, they've done that pretty well throughout the year. They've had a couple scares coming off of big wins, like Bowling Green after Florida, like Mississippi State after Missouri. That was a bye week as well. 
you got to take the next step. And I, I think I trust Elko to do that. We'll talk more about that later. But yes, I'm still thinking about it. I'm still thinking about Noble. In fact, I'm thinking I'm going to have to watch the game one more time. Alex Flo, definitely a memorable sun Saturday, but South Carolina definitely seems like they'll put up a fight. They absolutely will. Jay Wynn says, Drew, I'm sorry I might have gotten you banned from Ghost YouTube channel. I went over there today and said I'm coming here every week since you uh, and him did the Missouri show, and we gave AM good luck. The one week I did a preview with him for the Missouri show, we've had good luck since then, so maybe I should be banned from that channel. That's funny. Good to see you, Jay Wynn. John Peroni, good to see you, man. Play to win. Noah 2 Wavy. Cody. Ben. Adam H is going to the game. All right, folks, let me know your game day and good luck rituals. I'll do my best to accommodate while I'm at the game Saturday. Just be loud and be crazy, man. I don't, I don't have any rituals besides, you know, acknowledging that my heart will be in pain and I'll be shaking and I'll be screaming. You have seen me. You've been here in the watch parties. That's my ritual. Losing my freaking mind. Enjoy it, man. I've been to a game in williams Bryce. Really good atmosphere. And that's going to play to their advantage in the game. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Brian Scott in here. Who else is here today? I want to make sure I get everybody. Barnes, bye week for the Tide. It's our resident Bama fan. Don't have a repeat of the two season ago when USC uh, East punched you in the mouth on the kickoff. Yeah, we won that game outside of the kickoff points we gave up in that 2022 game. Time for a little payback. Some players on this team, the 2022s, the 2021s on the team, they remember that. Maybe that plays a factor. Maybe that gives you a little bit more focus for those guys. I've watched all things Aggies. I've been watching all things Aggies this week. It's been a great time. Dead Messenger, good to see you. He watched that video four times already. Great video, man. Chills. It was so loud in these headphones. I did not expect that. It blasted my ears. And I don't even have the, the volume max. It's like at 70. Kyle Field was absolutely crazy. I want to hear from anybody who was at the game. Put in the chat exactly how that atmosphere was. How does that rank in the best games you've been to? It was amazing watching it on TV. Barnes says, having watched both teams, you should be able to take care of your business and stay unbeaten in the SEC. I hope so. I hope so. I think I, I think it's possible. Gonna have to be very careful. House of Froats, Giggum. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Lash, good to see you. Gridiron Masters, howdy. I think South Carolina is the hardest game until TU. By the way, Elko clarified his statements. Yes, I totally agree. And definitely one of the top three defense we'll face on the year. It's Notre Dame. It's Texas. And I think it's pretty clear now that South Carolina is in that mix. They have dudes on this defense, very fast athletic front seven. They have a superstar at safety. It's a real challenge, man. We'll talk about it. Thanks for being here, Gridiron. Troy Ellison, what up, Drew? Good to see you, Troy. Thanks for stopping by, man. A little shy in the house. Good to see you, a little shy. Barnes says that re that bomb that read through on LSU was epic. Oh, yeah, we're going to take a look at that one today. How come we haven't seen Donovan Green yet? I just think the ACL recovery for a big dude who's gained weight has just been a challenge. And I think you have two tight ends that are playing pretty well in front of them. And I think they're just not going to rush him back. And I think it's pretty clear that's just how it is this year. It's unfortunate. We all love Donovan Green. But that's just, you know, that's just how the chips fell this year. But we wish him the best. We hope to see him back. We'll need him eventually. Noble guy back. Aggie man, good to see you. Nick Damez, good to see you, man. Zaddy, Zach, it might have been the loudest I've ever heard Kyle. I love to hear that, and it definitely seemed like that. I think the loudest moment watching on TV was Marcel's touchdown because, you know, you already built the buzz on the turnover, literally the play before. Shout out BJ Mays. What a great story. And then the next play, Marcel goes in. You get a crowd pop from that because obviously your offense was stalling with Connor. And then he scores. And then my sound system glitches out because it's just too much audio for my speakers to handle. And I'm not at the game. I mean, I'm sure it was incredible. Good for you guys. And Nick says, loudest I've ever heard, Kyle. Ronnie Barker from Tokyo, what's up? Carson, what up, man? Drop the like. Yeah, hit the like button, guys. Appreciate you guys being here. Where the F is Moose? Good question. Ask Moose. Cecil Simmons, hey, Drew. Is it just me or have you noticed a difference in the condition Aggies have been on the, uh, on the third and fourth quarters? They're in very good shape. Tommy Moffat, man, their offseason program, their dedication, how much they're demanding of these players in training sessions in practice we heard that tommy moffitt is tracking every effort this team puts out tommy moffitt and the training staff and the coaching staff the staff is tracking all the efforts all the energy they're putting onto the field all the energy they're putting into their workouts and they're pushing them right to their limit right to that threshold but they're not going over to over it they're not letting people get hurt we've been pretty good on injuries so far on in the year a couple of bad ones but some teams are way worse off than we are and it's very clear that this is a team that plays their best ball late in games. 
And that is such a gift. It's something we haven't had the last few years. It's a blessing. And we love Tommy Moffat for it. And, you know, obviously Elko allowing Moffat to just, you know, enact his program and to be himself and have full reign on what he wants to do. You, you don't usually, you don't always have that kind of allowance or flow within a, within a staff or within a, a coaching unit. And you have that with Elko. He lets him do his thing, which is great. Thanks for coming by, Cecil. Ronnie says, Nussmeyer threw more passes to A&M than Reed did. I know, man. Thank you, Nuss. No, I, that one of the narratives is that Nuss just gave the game away, and I don't agree. A&M rattled the guy. We'll talk about it later. Moose could have made a difference, bro. I, maybe. Thoughts on Josh Pate? Bald guy, good football takes. Those are my thoughts. He picked South Carolina today. Yes. Thanks, Josh. TMJ, boss. I wasn't there, but my media room was rocking. Yeah, we were rocking in this room, too, on the watch party, man. We'll do a watch party for the South Carolina game. Anybody wants to stop by. But all right, guy. All right, guys. Thanks for coming by. couple talking points before we get into the calls. I wanted to get back into the quarterback situation. So I told you guys last video that I really like the demeanor and the poise that Marcel Reed has shown in the big stage. He did it versus Florida. And that was on the road where A&M has not been successful the last few years. I would consider that a pretty relatively big stage. And Reed showed tremendous poise. We saw it on that first drive where they were backed up on their own side of the field after a penalty-ridden drive. He was able to get us out of it by, you know, timely runs, accurate clutch passes, third down conversions, extending plays with his legs, making throwing balls on the run. And then we saw it again on the biggest stage and in the biggest moment of the year versus LSU. And in fact, I would call myself a Marcel Reed lean right now in regards to the starting quarterback situation at Texas A&M. I said that in my last video. It's not breaking news. I've already said that. To be fair about that last game, it was obvious that LSU wasn't ready for a dual threat quarterback. You could tell by how helpless they were to stop it, how they would over pursue one running threat and disregard the other, how they just couldn't handle Marcel's speed. But Reed also showed some elite running ability, gamesmanship, and obviously just two, but a couple of really, really good passes in the game. I mean, you can't take away that he absolutely balled out when he was called upon. Both things can be true. And I'm not exactly encouraged by the fact that Connor Wigman has faded in two of the biggest games of the year, Notre Dame and LSU, and obviously didn't play his best game versus Mississippi State, an uneven game, some good, some bad. But we still know the tools that Connor has, and I still look at him as a viable option on the team. But he's not been able to use those tools consistently on the year. And I also really think that the main reason, aside from all that, that Reed might fit this offense going forward, is I, I think this team has kind of become a more Marcel Reed running attack friendly unit. Since Marcel conceded the job back to Connor in Missouri, I would argue a few things have developed. You've gotten Jabari Barber back at full go. He gets the ball in the short game. He gets open. He's a great slot receiver. You hand the ball off to him on end arounds. You do a lot of stuff with Jabari Barber. Amari Daniels has really come on since the midway point of the year. He played his best game of his career versus LSU. He was good versus Missouri. He had really good moments versus Mississippi State. He's blocking really well. And you've unfortunately lost one of your best offensive linemen in Chase Basantis which really showed in pass protection versus LSU. And we heard from Elko yesterday that Basantis will be reevaluated after the bye week. So that's a multi-week absence. So I would call him questionable for the um, New Mexico State game. Probably won't play in that one, but we'll see. And Terry Bussey, when healthy, has also shown that he's coming into his own. We saw his best versus Missouri. We saw him not play versus Mississippi State. We saw him kind of get back into the flow of things versus LSU. Had one really good handoff late in the game uh, on an end around with Amari Daniels as a really good lead blocker on that play. And we saw him throughout the game. He was getting open in the game early. Unfortunately, couldn't hit him. All this to say that with Marcel at quarterback, I think A&M is in a great position to equip a very diverse running attack that Colin Klein would love to operate. And that gets not only... The two running backs, because of course you have two of them, but the quarterback, Jabri Barber, Terry Bussey, all involved in the running game. I think there's room for a lot of deception in the running game, because one of the things you would say about Marcel when he was the quarterback was that you were very one-dimensional. You just sell out for the run. But I think you're, you, you can become much more diverse in your running game with a lot of the emergences that we've had over the last few weeks, because I think both backs 
are blocking really well. And I could say the same about both tight ends. You're getting great blocking out of Thor. You're getting good blocking out of Watson. And while I think the receivers are, you know, underrated in terms of route running, I think they've had their moments. They're not exactly a group that strikes fear into the hearts of opposing secondaries. So I really think this team, it, it, it really lends itself to that running quarterback system. And I think if Reed can build on those two, it was a tiny sample size, two passes in the game. They were both really good passes. Obviously, one was the long dime to Noah, and one was a, a great check down at the hands of an all-out blitz to uh, Le'Veon that was an explosive play. If you can just slip those in now and then, maybe pass 20 times a game and be a really run-heavy attack, I'm just throwing numbers out there, whatever it is, I think it could be pretty good as a running first team. And I think that's what Klein wants to do. Now, having said all that, the coaching staff knows better than I do. I'm, I'm, I always say this. I'm just a dude here talking from the couch. For all I know, they could trot Connor Wigman out and execute on an amazing game plan with Connor like they did against Missouri. We know he's capable when he's at his best. But to me, in my opinion, it's Marcel. I love the gamesmanship, man. I want to hear from you guys. What do you think about the quarterback situation? If you guys choose to call in, that's my first question to you guys. What's your take on the quarterback situation? What do you think they go with it? Do you think they start Connor, then pull Reed in if you need to? Do you think they do it the other way around? I think that's an option regardless of which direction you go. Because I think we have seen, at times, both quarterbacks at their best. But right now, I like Marcel. So, yeah. Let's check in with the chat before I get into my next stuff, which is going to be pulling some game clips. And I want to kind of go through the game, some of the key plays in the game, and break stuff down and kind of rehash the game. And then we'll get into South Carolina. But let's see what you guys are saying here in the chat after we went through that. I don't see how you don't start Reed first. South Carolina edge rushers can fluster Connor. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, they can get after it, man. Those edge rushers are elite. We'll talk about them. You just play the hot hand. Gamecocks scare me. Enjoy the true Drew takes more than the Pate State. <laughs> true Drew. More than the Pate State. Drake. We have to workshop that. I don't know if true Drew's the one, but I like, I like it. Their offense is horrible. They shouldn't score more than 14 points. Their offensive line, man, we can get after it. You can over-pursue Reed or he'll make you pay. You cannot over-pursue him. Yeah, I got you. I got you. Maybe Connor's feeling the pressure, having to look out for Reed. I just... Seems like Connor presses, right? Because we know the tools are there. It just seems like he's missing on things. And I know the, the game wasn't perfect for Connor to play well. There was leakage. Receivers weren't always getting open. But there were several plays where Connor had options to get the ball out, and he didn't. And I just like the demeanor from Reed a little bit more. This situation reminds me of the Dustin Long, Reggie McNeil situation back in 02 for some of you older ags. With how many teams do the read option now? It's just a cope by LSU fans. Yeah, I know. They should have been ready. But yeah, yeah, exactly. Got to come on strong and stay locked in all game. Absolutely, man. You cannot let up in this one. I think Connor's overthinking everything. Last year, injury, pocket collapsing, and career. The way he guns the football because he doesn't want an interception reminds me of Dak. Unfortunate. It was nice to beat the Bayou Bengals. Yeah, it was great. It was great. Is Barber our number one guy? Well, he wears number one. Hold on. I got a dog barking outside. Let's see if we can get taken care of. Yeah, I think Barber is the number one option receiver. I think he gets open the most consistently. I think he's a safety valve right now. I really like what Barber's showing. He's also a threat in the running game. They, they run a couple end arounds per game to him, a couple, um, you know, bubbles in most games to him. That's an extension of the running attack. I think you do that stuff with him and Reed, and I think it can work, but we'll see. Yeah, when you're watching the game, Connor would bullet the ball to running backs. Yeah, you had a couple drops, but I thought it was Connor being off timing, throwing the ball earlier and too hard to some of those shorter routes. I think maybe you can still grab those, but I don't think the quarterback was helping him out in those situations. Troy says he thinks Connor's in a play. Connor doesn't throw much to the tight ends like Reed does. It's true. Troy says play Connor. That's fair. Thoughts on Jimi Hendrix? He's a bald guy with good football takes. Yeah, South Carolina's O-line is not good. Yeah, that's the thing. That's where I think we can get our advantage. Reed starting against South Carolina. We have no idea. I don't think we'll know till the day of, I really think. Alex Flo says, I would go with Reed, but it would be nice to see his passing numbers go up this game. Yeah, I know. I, we got to get that going, I think. I think we need to. Was that the game? It was loud from the first play to the last. I love it, man. What an atmosphere. Will Donovan Green or Moose get integrated back to the office? Moose, maybe. Depends on his you know day-to-day -day work in the practice. It sounds like that's where he's deficient. We know he's a gamer but it sounds like he's not earning the right to play on Saturdays. That's what it sounds like from what the coaches have said about him and the evidence we have that he's just not playing. I think Green is still probably a year out. I think it's just a long road back from an ACL being a heavier guy that gained weight. 
All right. The front seven changed the game in third, getting more pressure, forcing bad passes. Yeah, man. And it was by way of manufactured blitz, but they were also just getting after that O-line and just dominating the trenches, man. We have such a good defensive line. Can't take it for granted. I know they don't have the sack numbers that maybe you might think an a defensive line like that would, but they absolutely have the pressures. They absolutely have the havoc. They absolutely affect the running game. We're now a top 20 run-stop defense. We came out of the McNeese game like 120 or 110th. I mean, it's it's been a great development for this D-line. All right, as we like to do, I'm going to go into a few game clips. Now, keep in mind, I am not an X's and O's expert. I'm, I don't even know if I'd call myself a novice. I just like to show you guys some of my favorite plays and talk about the game in this way. Oops. All right. Torin York had a great bounce back, like stretch of games these last three games, right? He's led the team in tackles for about three or four straight games, maybe more than that. Great game versus Missouri, even better versus Mississippi State. And I think versus LSU, he had his best game of his career. Uh, I forget exactly what play this was, but this is Torin with a tackle for loss at the start of the game. Look at him just break through the arms of the blocker, make a big tackle. And this was just the beginning of what was to come for a great night for Torin York. You know, the defense didn't play great in the first half. They definitely were lackluster in the tackling department. But you think about what you gave up in the first half. You give up a score on a short field after the uh, Le'Veon Moss fumble. And then you gave up that explosive 73-yard touchdown. And that was just a bad angle by Dalton Brooks, a busted play. But outside of that, what you were able to do as a defense is force them to kick long field goals. Of course, they missed those. I think that's a textbook Ben Don't Break mantra. Now, we've talked a lot about Ben Don't Break over the last few years. App State was a game where you just bent and bent and bent and got ball controlled and you didn't stop them and they just controlled the game. I brought up App State, take a shot. This game, you did give up yardage, give up 400 passing yards in the game, but you made them one-dimensional and you forced them into long field goals. That can be a winning recipe if you're able to score. And it was in the game. Let's see what this is. This is Shamar. Okay, Shamar Turner didn't have the stats, but he was wreaking havoc in the game. Stuff like this. He was enraged before this game. You saw the pregame scuffle. Look at him just beat the man here on the inside run. I mean, he's a scary human being. Just one-on-one -on -one beating a guy. You get this with this defensive line. Not everybody has this, guys. Dalton Brooks. This is, there's a couple of great things happening in this play. Look at Dalton Brooks recognize this right away. This is a play. It's like a huge rub route. They're trying to run a bunch of routes right here, get the running back open right there. Hopefully there's traffic here to get Dalton Brooks in the corner, you know, bundled up and not able to make this tackle. But look at the recognition right here. Boom. He's on it. But how does he know? Look at Torian. Look at Torian identify what's going to happen in the play. Because I think they ran this play a couple times in the game. And I don't know if this is Torian getting this in the comms. I can't, I don't see the, the play clock, but... Look at him point it out. Tell Dalton Brooks to get out there and go. Torian York is such a weapon, even when he's not making tackles or, you know, coming up with interceptions in the game. He's just directing traffic here. And Dalton Brooks is so fast and so athletic. And he had a couple bad plays in the game. But you still get stuff like this out of Dalton. York's a genius, man. I freaking love Torian. I mean, he was taking his lumps early in the year. He got his fair share of criticisms early in the year. This is a great play by Cassius Howell. Another guy that didn't have the crazy numbers in the game and maybe doesn't get the love he should get week to week, but the hustle and effort by Cassius Howell in this game was second to none. He's been asked to do a lot of stuff in coverage in kind of a drop role at defensive end, and here he mans up with Mason Taylor, who's one of the most sure-handed tight ends in the country, and I don't know if you say he technically jarred this ball loose, but you cannot deny that having a 240-pound body on top of you could affect your ability to come down with the ball. That's a touchdown. The ball is in his hands. But Howell's in position to interact with this play and jar it loose. And this is one where you, I think you forced a field goal on this one. There's another play I think I'm going to show you guys about Cassius Howell's hustle, man. Okay. Le'Veon got our good friend Jarden Gilbert twice in the game. What is this? Inside zone? Yeah. Cut back. Look at... Moss is such a monster. But look at him just absorb the tackle from Gilbert here. Run through him. Spin out of it. 10 more yards on the play. 15 more yards on the play. 
And this is one of two where he gets Gilbert. We were picking on Gilbert a lot on the night, guys. Unfortunately, Gilbert had to leave the game with injury. You hate to see that, but Le'Veon, man. Le'Veon Moss. That's the tweet. That's it. Oh, uh, we talked about, or I don't know if we talked about it on this channel, but we, a lot of us were aware that LSU was going to line up in this funky look. I don't know how many people run this, but for a pass rush, it can probably be very confusing to have to assign, you know, blockers to specific pass rushers when they're all in a line like this. But apparently we had a game plan. If they were going to line up like this, we're just going to run zone in, inside zone. You just run right at it. And you run right through it. It's third and eight. Probably a passing down. But you run the ball, and they have nothing for it. You blow a hole wide open. I don't know what Jabri Barber... I, I think they checked it to a run, and Jabri was still running the pass here. Because look at Jabri. It's kind of funny. Look at Jabri still running his route. Oh, got to block someone. Uh, still got the first down. Amari Daniels is coming on, man. The way he flows with the offensive line now... He's really, really changed his game up. And that's what we called for in the midpoint of the year. At least I did. This is Moss getting Gilbert again. I think it's just bulldozing him over for a first down. A little power right. Yeah, get trucked. Get a first down. Love it. Le'Veon's a weapon. This is just uh, Mike Elko's masterclass right here. So obviously they're showing six here in pressure. But... That's not the only place you can bring pressure from. So they're assigning, you know, a player to the running back, a hot player to the quarterback. These guys all have someone to block. But they're not accounting for this guy over here, this nickel over here. Or that's Dalton Brooks. So it's the safety over here. And he's unaccounted for. Puts Nuss on the clock. Incomplete pass. AM's ball. I mean, this is the stuff you got Nuss with all night. And then you started to get to him with four later. Just epic, man. I mean, you can manufacture pressure in so many ways, but on top of that, you have elite players. I mean, obviously the D-line is elite. I would consider Dalton Brooks an elite. I've called him a superstar in the making. Scooby Williams is coming on. Is that Torin York? Torin York's a beast. No, that's Cassius Howell. I mean, yeah, that's just really hard to stop for an O-line. Yeah, because you have the, the running back blocking here. You have, I think, people blocking. Because you drop him back, you're blocking no one over here, and he's just wide open. Yeah, it's beautiful. I love it. Now, South Carolina's going to do stuff like that to us, and they have similar athletes, not as big as us, not as strong as us, but they have speed. They're going to do stuff like that, too, that, you know, Reed or Connor are going to have to deal with. Here's BJ, uh, BJ May's first interception, and this is an ill-advised throw from Nuss, but I want you to appreciate Cassius Howell on this play. I think this is Cassius right here. I, he's either going to spy or he's going to get um, stiffed by the tackle. He does not get initial penetration. I think the penetration comes from right here but look at Howell here Howell puts Nuss on the clock to get rid of this ball and it's right to BJ Mays BJ Mays gets his first interception of his career and his first start as a Texas A&M Aggie I mean I just love this man look at this all-out sprint this is just desire this is want to and honestly I'm just going through this on the fly so we're going to look at Torin York's interception at the end of the game and I think this might be the same assignment. Because when you look at Torian's interception later in the game, he shows pressure here, and then he drops out into a spy look, and then he intercepts the ball here because the quarterback doesn't notice Torian York, who is smaller and sneakier in size, behind these big bodies, and he gets in front of the interception. I think this is the same call but to Cassius Howell here because he shows blitz or he shows pressure here. He backs out, spying. An all-out sprint. Love the effort. Look at that all-out. I mean, look at him. I mean, this is football, right? You're going to do that, but it's just great to see from the big dude, the big fella. Unsung hero coming off the bench. Him, and to a probably even higher degree, the Shields and Ryland Kennedy, really unsung heroes of the team. And then, I'll just show this real quick. Really good moment. He never put the ball down after the interception. He still, he never puts it down. This is after the pick. He walks it right over to his family. Gives it to them. This is kid's first start. He was at Incarnate Word. He was at UAB. And now he is playing a pivotal role on one of the biggest wins in Texas A&M's recent history. And he walks it over to the fam. They're going to take it back to the crib. Beautiful. Good feels. DJ Hicks is coming on. This is just a beautiful one-on-one -on -one swim move. Look at him right here. Oh. Dude. If we're going to get this from DJ Hicks... 
your backup inside defensive tackle? Come on. This dude's so important. We've talked about it. I talk about it in every video I put out this week, but he's the future of the D-line, man. You're losing three key guys. I don't know if you lose Regis this year. You might. This guy has to come on, and he's coming on right now. I mean, that's just a beastly move. File it under things you love to see. All right. This is just nuts with nowhere to go. And I want to take a minute to talk about this. So we saw Nuss really kind of disintegrate in the game. I'm blocking this. We saw Nuss fizzle out, run out of options, make bad decisions as the game went on. But we hit him. We flushed him out. We intercepted him. We confused him. We showed man dropped into zone. We painted a muddy picture for him. A&M took Garrett Nussmeyer out of his game. And look, Nuss came with the possibility of making mistakes. That was always built into Garrett Nussmeyer. He was never a pure, you know, textbook quarterback. He was always a gunslinger. He was always going to take risks. That's who he is. But you encouraged him and forced him to take more risks than he wanted to. And you rattled him. And I would absolutely argue that the 12th man getting louder and louder and more and more rowdy played a factor in his deterioration throughout the game. So I don't want to hear that Nuss gave this game up. I don't want to hear that Nuss just threw the game away to Texas A&M. Texas A&M ripped it out of his cold, dead hands. That's pretty dark. That's pretty dark, Drew. Chill out. All right, Torrin York again. I don't even remember this play. Oh, okay, so Torrin York gets the tackle here. But oh, this was scary by Shamar Turner getting another penalty. But this is what a good D-line does. Look at the space that Shamar Turner clears out right here for Torian just to make a textbook tackle. Look at him just move body. Clean lane for a tackle. That's the kind of stuff that Turner does that doesn't get put on the stat sheet. And it's not just him. Albert Regis does this. DJ Hicks is now doing it. Rodas Johnson does it. But Shamar Turner is the best at it. He's just elite. He's elite at just those one-on-one -on -one wins. But other guys are really good too. All right, here's just Scooby's textbook tackle. I mean, this feels like a targeting based on just our feeling watching football, how we're holding our breath every time a big hit happens in football. But big credit to Scooby for getting his head out of the way and tackling with his shoulder pad. That was huge, and that forced the, the, the bobbled snap that was forced by the 12th man. Boom. Legal. Legal assault. Love to see it. All right. This is Marcel's quarterback draw. Probably with an option to pass to someone right here. But he steps back, makes a decisive decision. Decisive decision is um, redundant, but you know what I mean. Tucks it and just goes. I just freaking love that play. That was such a gritty Texas A&M Mike Elko touchdown right there. Just the ability to, to fight and push to the end of the whistle, past the echo of the whistle, and get it in there. Okay, this play is crazy. Because at first glance, it's an insane play to be able to get this ball pulled on what you would think is a zone read. But what we heard from Marcel in the postgame presser is that this was not an option play. This was a handoff. And he just went off the cuff and pulled this. I mean, come on now. That is so close to being a possible fumble situation there. Because if Amari squeezes that, and Reed pulls back, that ball can get jarred loose. But he got it out of there. That was insane. That was an insane play because that wasn't the assignment. It wasn't his own read, according to Marcel. I mean, that's gamesmanship right there. Someone says um, Caleb Williams moment. Yeah, it was. Where Caleb Williams pulled the ball out of that guy's hands or whatever it was. Here's the pass to Noah. So I'm thinking, I was saying this on the watch party. You just gave up a touchdown. You have nine, ten minutes to go in the game. You're running all over their asses. This is the first time in the game where you have Marcel Reed as your quarterback and you have the full field ahead of you because Marcel was given short fields by way of missed field goals, by way of interceptions. But here you have the full field. I'm thinking, okay, we have an opportunity to milk some clock. The running game's working. Let's go for it. And guess what? LSU was thinking the same thing. 
Watch the safety. Watch the nickel. The nickel's already creeping in here, but watch this safety. When the play starts, the safety freezes. The safety does not get back in coverage. This is cover three, I believe. And this guy is just a half step behind, and Reed's going to deliver the ball right over his head. Hard catch to make over your shoulder going full speed with two dudes around you. But watch Jarden. Jarden freezes. See? Let's look at that false step by Jarden. Takes a step forward. Watch. That was a questionable tackle right there. Crown over, yes. Crown over had his best game, I think. Crown over had his best game as an Aggie, and that's going to be huge next week going up against two really, really good defensive ends. All right, another just Le'Veon Moss being a monster. Inside zone, just, and he points at him. Ooh, yeah, that was you. Spears is a true freshman. Vish. What is this play? I don't even remember this play. I think this is a sack. Oh, yeah. This is uh, DJ Hicks and Shamar. I mean, uh, Nick Scorton. And then Scorton dancing on the grave. Look at Hicks with the bull rush. Look at DJ Hicks, man. Look at the young fella. And obviously, this is just a freak right here. Against Emery Jones, who's a first-round pick next year. At worst, a second-round pick. Yeah, Nick Scorton's on draft boards, too. Speed by Scorton. Bull rush. No, bull rush by Hicks in the dance by Scorton. You doubled their sack total for the year in the game. Here's Torian on the interception, and you'll see that it's the same thing that we just noticed on the fly that Cassius Howell did early in the game. I, one of these guys is, I think, one of these is Torian. Torian's going to show pressure, drop back into a spy, but look at how Torian kind of is hidden behind these huge bodies right here, and he sneaks in front of the, the, the uh, check down. He's hidden. Can't see him. There he is. And I think uh, I think Torian was a little silly on this play because he had gotten licked the play before on a Garrett Nussmeyer scramble for a first down. He made the tackle, but he got hit hard. And he was, you know, dazed when he got up and he makes this play the next play. But sometimes it pays to be small. You're hidden behind these big bodies. Don't see him right there. And that was the game sealer. And I don't think I have the picture of Nuss up right now, but you know what he did next. It was the great Serenda Cobra. This is just a perfectly blocked play. You got better throughout the game offensive line-wise. Shanahan and Dewberry. In the, oh no, that's not Dewberry. That's Reed Adams. So close to a touchdown. But, I mean, it's an easy game when you get a hat on hat. It really is. Beautiful. All right, I think that's it. I think that's it. Got some commits out of it. Yeah. And this is my favorite picture of the game. This was the Marcel touchdown where the offensive line pushed him in at the last minute. Look at our pad level compared to theirs. Playing through the end of the whistle. Pay, playing through the echo of the whistle. Not doing that over here. Big bodies. And Tommy Moffat agrees because he retweeted this. Brag. All right, guys. That's all I have from you for you from the game. Let's check in with the chat one time. Colin link is pinned. I see people in there. I think we should just get right into the calls. Uh, I was, oh, we'll do a couple of words on South Carolina. Then we'll get into the calls. I'll go right into that. And then we'll get into the calls. So we're go moving on from that game. We're still relishing in it. The team can't afford to do that. We know we've talked about it Saturday night, Williams Bryce stadium, 7 30 PM local time. Sandstorm will be rocking. The Cox will be cocking. And we have a hell of a challenge guys. Is it a trap game? I really don't think it is. And if you look at the schedule coming off of a big emotional game like LSU, maybe you look at it kind of like a letdown position. But I think South Carolina is just a good football team. They're, they're four and three. But their losses to LSU and Alabama were just a couple of, you know, calls or plays away from them being a, a six and one football team right now. They played well enough in each of those games to win. But they either had the calls go against them or made the mistakes in the game to get them out of that realm. They have an elite defense. Super athletic front seven. They have a superstar at safety. It's a dangerous game. And everybody knows it. Even Vegas knows it. It's a two and a half point um, spread in favor of Texas A&M with a tiny 44 and a half over under. And yeah, you better bet your ass is going to be a defensive showdown. Because yeah, we feel pretty good about some of the offensive developments we've seen from Texas A&M. 
But I think it's pretty clear that this is the best defense we've faced since Notre Dame. They have bodies, studs, All-Americans, freshman All-Americans, all over this defense. And offensively, I think they're a few steps behind where A&M is, especially at the offensive line spot. And I think that's where we have the big advantage of the game. But they have a chance to slow this game out and make it a, a very muddy game for Texas A&M. So it's obviously critical. You want to get into that Texas game with no losses. That would be the best case scenario. And this is the hardest game before then. And it feels like every game since Florida, we've said, okay, if the Aggies can get this one, we know what they are. We know where we are. Does it feel like that again? It's kind of crazy that we're saying that like in week nine, because we kind of are. It's like old A&M would probably slip up right here, but I feel like I have a different level of faith in the program right now. I really do. And I'm not making my prediction right now. I'm going to do a preview video tomorrow. But it's a huge task for Elko and company to navigate being that targeted team, a top 10 team. You have to focus up after a huge emotional game. And, you know, like I said, we've been reflecting on it. The team can't do that. And this home team, South Carolina, feels like they have a chance to finish really strong on their year. I mean, they've had a couple slip-ups on the year, but look at their schedule. They have us at Vandy, which is never easy this year, but they can do it. Home versus Missouri, I would pick South Carolina in the game. Wofford, then the rivalry at Clemson. They feel like they can have an eight or nine win season, and that starts with this huge home opportunity, their biggest home opportunity left on the schedule versus Texas A&M. So I'll, like I said, I'll get deeper into that game with the preview video I'm going to drop tomorrow night. And of course, we'll go live again later this week, give you guys a chance to preview that game, give me your score prediction. But tonight, for all the callers waiting in the, in the, in the waiting room, I see you guys in there. I want to hear your thoughts coming out of that LSU game and specifically how you feel about the quarterback situation. With that, we'll get right into the calls. Rich, you're on with Drew. How you feeling, man? I'm doing well. How you doing? I'm still feeling great, man. I'm riding that high and you know, I'm not necessarily focused up for South Carolina, but I hope the team is. Yeah, yeah. And honestly, I, everybody's talking about it, but I feel with the new leadership, like they, that's something that they don't, they don't drop the ball, making sure they're prepared. I think if we lose, it's not going to be because we look past this game or anything. Um, but, you know, to be fair, I, I, uh, I, I, I mean, going into just quick South Carolina, I, I feel good, better than other people. I think it's it's a scary game, no doubt, but I think the matchup's tough for them. I, I think their offensive line versus our defensive line is, is a big mismatch that is really going to make it come down to. Uh, I think we, and this is leading into my quarterback thought, is the, the key to this next game is, no mistakes, you know, limited mistakes on offense. I think our defense is the mismatch there. I think we have a lot of confidence coming off that LSU win in that, that second half. But I think it's just going to be about not making mistakes on offense. Uh, it is a very good defense. But when you look at that, when you do look at that, you know, when you say that, I, I, when I say that, um, you look at the two quarterbacks – and just look at their stat numbers. And when you want to look at a quarterback with limited mistakes, you got to go with the guy with 11 touchdowns, zero interceptions versus the guy with three touchdowns and four interceptions. I mean, I never thought that I would be saying this, but it's not Connor's offense anymore. And I think Elko and the staff know that more than they're letting it out to be just by that second half really sealed the deal. Yeah, I think I'm inclined – to agree with you and we've heard not not only is the evidence there for reed but we've talked he's talked about how his dad who is a coach has instilled into him that when in doubt just use your legs you have the speed you have not only speed but you have wiggle you have instincts running the football and you take care of the damn thing and that's going to be so huge in this game because south carolina is a very opportunistic football team we saw it versus ou they ended that game before it could start by way of turnovers and they take advantage of mistakes and as much as I, I do acknowledge that Connor has the tools he's just shown that he can't be consistent with them so I would also lean read with you and I, I agree with everything you're saying yeah and I know Elko's talked about a lot about well we see all the thousands of reps this is just a small sample and, and that's very true and that's when Drinkwitz was like you know kind of 
talking about how we're definitely starting Reed and they came out with Connor, I was like, absolutely, we come back with Connor. You know, he yeah. he won this game, but this or he won this this starting position. But you know, going into this game, it's um, you know, it it's they saw thousands of snaps in practice, but look at the two styles of quarterbacks and tell me how who's going to look better in a practice the style wise when a quarterback is not going to get touched the passer is going to look really good and when you got a runner and a scrambler again especially against our you know front seven that doesn't look as strong in practice and also that's very gameish like yeah it shows better and it plays better in a game and i think the staff and the fans especially are seeing that and that's right. I think the gameplay is going to be the deciding factor, and it has been. It's just Connor. It's it's crazy. I I was so high on him for the last couple of years, even coming into this year, but he has looked abnormally bad. I mean, uh, he he seems so uncomfortable. Yeah, and you know, I, I wouldn't take away the possibility that he could find it. I trust the staff to make the right decision. That's still an option there, but I totally agree with you. And and you're right. At some point, you do have thousands of practice reps to look at, but the game reps will eventually overtake that once you have a sample size. And I think we have just seen that Marcel Reed is a gamer. However, he's not perfect. We have to acknowledge that. We, we've seen that his ability to read a defense, especially under pressure, has not been consistent. But he can improve, and he has taken care of the ball, and he has not made critical game-altering mistakes, and that's huge. But... Yeah, man. Any other thoughts coming out of this game? Um, only other thought, like those black unis were unbelievable. It gave me some any given Sunday vibes Dude. of, especially with Reed behind center. It just it it was it was awesome. Great win. Really hurts that Basantis is out. I don't, I'm not sure if I trust Dewberry as much, but Shanahan looks good. Um, yeah, and I and I think you know it was a big win and. It, it makes sense that people are, are taking that same approach with South Carolina. They're still a dangerous team. But when you look at the matchups, I, I do feel comfortable about this game. It's just we need to limit mistakes, which we haven't over the years. And I think Marcel helps us with that. 100%, man. Well, all right, Rich. I appreciate the call, man. Hope to hear from you soon. You have a great night. You too. All right. Noble, you're on with Drew. How you feeling, man? What do you got to get off your chest? Oh, man. Uh, can you hear me? I'm yeah. using my headphones again today. Yeah, you're good. Okay, yeah. So, um, yeah, <laughs> what a crazy game. Yeah. Um, as far as the quarterbacks in the situation going forward, um, I do think uh, I agree. We start Marcel against South Carolina. As the individual matchup this weekend, uh, I think lends itself towards a more mobile, dual threat quarterback, especially, you know, if we have to escape those, uh, those monsters they have at DNs. Uh, we're going to want to be able to have, um, you know, an escape route. Um, yeah. And I don't think, like, with the – unless Connor, you know, absolutely shows lights out. Um, I mean, he, like, he couldn't even deal with the LSU pass rush. It was pretty miserable. Not that the O-line was helping him, but he just doesn't have the mobility like uh, like Reed does. Um, but after that, I think um, we go into the bye week, and so you don't have to make a decision on how um, – until New Mexico State – and I think, honestly, you play both of them in New Mexico State. You go um, on alternate drives or give them different halves because New Mexico State's just a, like our chance to like really figure out who's taking over the job. Because next, you win the game this week, and then, I spe- then you spend the next two weeks to figure out who your QB1 is. Um, because I, I want it to be Marcel. This, this wouldn't be an, an, a question if Marcel could just prove that he was a proven yeah, passer. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It's, so if- it's, not, it's not an issue at that point, but we don't know yet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're coming out of it shaky out of South Carolina, you, God forbid, lose the game, you don't feel great about the performance. I think there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of validity to what you're suggesting there because you can use that as kind of a sample or you can also use it to create more of a diversion and not knowing, not letting Auburn know what you're going to go with. But obviously, I think the best path would be whoever starts versus South Carolina just takes it and runs with it. And that's what I'm banking on right now. But yeah, man, I, I, I think they've stopped the run pretty well on the year. But what AM has on that South Carolina front seven is a really good offensive line who's done nothing but improve this season, and we're much bigger than their front seven. They're a very fast, athletic unit. 
but I think we can match body for body. I think our tight ends can do a, a solid job in there blocking some linebackers, do, doing some stuff, getting dirty. And it's going to come down to that. It's going to come down to can you run block these twitchy edge guys that they use on both sides. And their starting tackles, they're like 290, 63 a apiece. They're not the biggest, but they get great penetration. So we'll have to see. We'll have to see. I, I really want to see Reed in the game. But, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. We'll let the coaches decide. I think um, – and then it's, it's just crazy how much the playbook changes up when you have um, uh, Marcel Reed instead of uh, Connor. Um, even though what I, the best way to describe that situation, I think, is a – imagine like a Venn diagram. On one side you have Marcel and then the other side you have Connor, but then there's a middle ground where um, obviously it's all the same looks. Yeah. But I think uh, – I mean, if you're running a read off from Connor, no one's taking Connor. Like they're just going to yeah, close, yeah. uh, close on that. Um, and then the other part was it, it's almost like in a baseball analogy is like, if someone's in a slump, you don't necessarily want to give up on them. Right. Um, unless like, I don't want to, I don't want to like, give the job to Marcel unless Marcel has taken it. Not so much that Connor has given it up. If that makes any sense. Um, and I want, I think Marcel can be that guy. I, it's just crazy. Like, if we if we go next year and like let's say Marcel's the starting quarterback in forward and Connor transfers out and we see Connor absolutely dotting teams up and we're like what were we doing wrong in our end uh, that we couldn't get uh, you know Connor to perform like in this right because we've seen the tape on where he's good the, the tools yeah. are there and yeah. obviously you got to go with the hot hand um, this is gonna be unpopular just uh, <laughs> unpopular statements but. I, uh, because I, I, Connor's performed so badly in the biggest moments, yeah. and I don't know if that's just all mental, uh, but uh, I mean, there were times where, like, you know, the offense was letting him down, the O line just wasn't there, the wide receivers were getting open. Until the times they were, like, yeah. the it, it was, it was like, you see the receiver open, his eyes are shifted towards another receiver, yeah. and it's like, oh, just can we be patient or? But when he does make the throw, it's just completely whack. Uh, it, it's so frustrating to go for the team. Yeah, and you know he has the tools, and he's just not making the plays, and, that, and that's just very scary. And you, you wonder what he's going through, man. It's got to be a mental hurdle because we've seen him dot defenses up. So, yeah, man, uh, I'm Reed, but I'll keep saying this. I'll keep going back to this. I absolutely trust the coaching staff. They've earned our trust. I agree. I agree. And I, I think, uh, I'm not going to have a fuss either way about it. I'm not going to have a fuss. Any closing thoughts, Noble? I got, a, I got some calls stacking up. Yeah, yeah, real quick. Uh, from a big picture – uh, standpoint, I don't think uh, and I'm getting the dues deserve credit out of this <laughs> uh, coming week. Uh, it is wild some of the takes I have. Reese Davis and Aaron Murray continue to just like a uh, hound a and and then like uh, <laughs> it's like we didn't do anything after last week. So I'm convinced like uh, let's get to Atlanta and just prove everybody wrong. Like, because that's the only way we're going to get any kind of respect right here. Hell yeah. All right, Noble, you have a great night. I appreciate the call, and thanks for uh, sticking in for the long haul after the game. That was fun. Oh, of course. All right, anytime. Everyone have a good night. Later. All right, moving right along. We got calls stacking up. Anybody else wants to get in here, you could probably jump in. All right. Merlin, you're on with Drew. What's on your mind tonight? Yo, can you hear me? Yeah, what's going on, man? Uh, I mean, it's it's going. You know, it's it's a good weekend. Uh, we're going into a good week. Um I don't think that this is a trap game by any means. I think uh, Elko and, and the team is well aware of what's up. Right. But I think that this is going to be. I think this is going to be a, a, a close game. I think if you look at their past uh, performances, especially at home, South Carolina is definitely a, their their players. Um, yeah. But I think. Uh oh, you cut out. Your phone probably went to sleep. Just tap the screen; it'll come back up. Hello. Yeah, I got you now. Okay, sorry about that. You're good. Um, no, yeah, I, th I think I think that there's definitely uh, uh, wiggle room on on our offense. I, I like I like the read pick going in, but I think that they'll probably have Connor ready to go. Hundred percent. Yeah. Whichever way they go, I, I just know they'll be willing to go the other direction if the game dictates it. Whether it's someone having a bad day, whether it's the looks they're getting. They, they have that option right now because both have had good moments in the year. And I would say one side has been more consistent than the other, but you always have that option. And if they're, you know, selling out for the run, you want to surprise them, throw Connor in for a drive or vice versa. That's always there. And you're right, man. This team, South Carolina, finds ways to stay in games. And I'm going to make a big point of this in my next video I make. 
they're gonna run trick wacky plays especially on special teams they're coming off a bye week he already does that shit that's what he does that's what shane beamer does is beamer ball he does the fake punts the fake field goals there's gonna be craziness in the game and we have to be ready for that they're gonna give us the full effort this is the full treatment we're gonna get in this game and yeah man that's that's got to be it any closing thoughts yeah. man yeah, I think the biggest thing, um, I just I do have some small worries on offense. Uh, I like the read pick, like I said, uh, but I just worry about him getting too one dimensional potentially. Yeah. I don't I don't think that'll be a problem, but I mean South Carolina's gonna be looking at him now and I don't think LSU was prepared for him. South Carolina's definitely gonna be looking at him. Yeah, that's a good point because obviously in Missouri they weren't expecting Connor. Obviously versus LSU they weren't expecting Reed. And you can even make the point that Florida wasn't expecting Reed fully. They might have been ready and flexible, and maybe we'll get a similar look to that versus South Carolina, but against a better team. And, yeah, man, uh, you just can't look past them. I don't think they will. I think they're going to get their best effort, man. Uh, yeah. Do you want to give a score prediction or anything, or are you going to what, – what do you want to go with? I'll give you another minute if you want it. Yeah, I mean, I, I got, like, a rough idea. Uh, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking, like, 24 for South Carolina – I'll call it uh, 30 for uh, us. Okay. So that would be a pretty strong over. So, yeah, I mean, it's very possible. It's very possible. I, I, I will say I think this defense can hold them under 20, and I would be curious to see how they would get to 24. But it's possible because – they're going to be, you know, well, we're going to be well scouted. We're going to have the full, like I said, the full treatment. Yep. So they're going to have some gadgets ready for us. They're going to make their adjustments. They have a very, very viable backfield with Rocket and Lenoris. And yeah, we'll see what happens. But all right, Merlin, I appreciate the call, man. Thank you very much. See ya. See ya. All right. Yeah, guys, if you're not going to call in Thursday, I forgot to say earlier, you're free to give your score prediction tonight. We typically do score predictions on Thursday. We have a chance to enter the Hall of Fame right there, written in Sharpie, featured for future shows. This will be ongoing for years, seasons, because we only had one this year, so this board's going to have plenty of space. But if you're not going to call in Thursday or Friday whenever I have it, give me your score prediction tonight. All right. Theo, you're on with Drew, man. What's going on, my friend? Hey, Mr. Drew. How are you? Doing great. Feeling great, but ready for the how next one. That, uh, how was that Spurs game? The Spurs game, you know... It wasn't the best because we lost. We were getting blown out for most of the game. They came back in the game. We made it close, but couldn't get over the hump. Also, not a big fan of the Houston Rockets. I'm sorry if there are any Houston people in the chat. Not my favorite team, being a Spurs fan. But it was nice to get out there for the first game of the year. Thanks for asking. Awesome, awesome. So, we definitely have this loving conversation going between us in terms of offenses and schemes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I want people to understand that the issues that Connor had Saturday weren't all on Connor. Um, Connor did have some issues on his own, but I've seen this happen to quarterbacks who have been injured multiple times um, in their short careers. And it's, it's the fear of coming back and being hit and taking another injury. And I've noticed it in this season where in the Notre Dame game, Notre Dame got pressure on Connor early, quickly, in the first couple drives. Mm -hmm. And he withdrew to that shell where he was reading his reads really fast and he was trying to get rid of the ball. Um the problem is, is he doesn't trust his legs to run anymore like he did a few years ago. Part of that could be from the whole ankle injury he came back from last year. Yeah, and after that Notre Dame game, I, I know maybe people are thinking, oh, that's speculation. It's, I think it's pretty evident. But also, Elko acknowledged it after the Notre Dame game. He used the words, I think Connor was feeling some residue from the past. He said that. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think that's a factor. We, we go into the next week. He doesn't get hit early. He doesn't get hit in, at all, really. He goes in. He puts in pretty good numbers. He had like an 81% accuracy. Yeah. Even with a, a sore AC cuff. Yep. Um, and did his thing. Then he comes back against Missouri. Missouri doesn't get the pass rush on him early. He gets settled to the, into the game, and he carves up Missouri. When they did try to get pass rush on him, he was able to answer and respond. Yeah, it's a really good point. And 
versus LSU, you're right. It wasn't all on him. He got hit early. There was a pass rush in his face. Left guard playing in for Basantis was struggling at times in pass pro. And you could argue that took him out of his game because after that, you did see him miss open receivers. You would see him just look off guys who were available and yeah. scramble was... and try things that he shouldn't have tried. And you could argue that he got put out of the game by being hit and the residue. That's a good argument. But having said and... that, there's also a path for him to gain rhythm. That's also there. There also is yes. a path for him to gain confidence. Yeah, so hopefully, you know, when he gets to the film room this week, he'll be able to gain that confidence knowing that it's there. It's, it's He's going to have to learn how to overcome that mindset of, okay, I got hit. I got to get out of here. No, yeah. you're okay to be hit. You're okay to get hit every once in a while. You've got to be able to step in the pocket and deliver the throw. That's there. Yeah. Because – Colin Klein was absolutely in his bag. I love every bit of it. Between everything he was trying to Uh-oh. I might have lost you there. So, if it was me, I would probably read. You would start read? shocking. Okay. I'd probably start read for a few series. Let our offensive line get into the game and gel and get used to the speed of the speed rushers that South Carolina has because they're absolutely monsters. Mm -hmm. And then bring in Connor and see what he has for a series or two. Now, do you think that's black and white? Oh, sorry. You were about to say having said that. Go ahead. And having said that, you would play it back and forth to see how they do. Um Unless if Reed Connor, starts with a hot hand, right? Unless Reed starts – well, it depends on what kind of hot hand. Because if you're talking about hot hand with rushing and all that, then no. I need Reed to be shown and can show consistently that he can make the passes that he's going to be needed to make in order to beat Texas and to beat these college football playoff teams. I still definitely fear that – we haven't seen enough of Reed, so we haven't been able to see him actually read and play and make mistakes in the system. And I fear that at this moment, it's one of those 22 catch. <laughs> Hold on just a second. I'll respond real quick. So I get the idea of doing that. I get finding your best long-term option by doing that. But I don't know if this team at this point in the year in such a high stakes game can afford to do that in this game. I, I think that's an option. And I think if you're not getting the look you want with Reed, you do that a hundred percent. But I think even if Reed is moving the ball by just running, if you're super one dimensional, but you're just getting stuff done, I'm not changing a thing. I would stick with it because I need to win this game. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. If it's a if it's a run heavy system, and that's all, you're super one dimensional. I'm riding it. That's what I. That's that's where I would differ. It's not from just you. about this game, though. Oh, I, I disagree. It's I think, not just about this game. I think this game is about this game. This isn't New Mexico. This is a game that you cannot afford to lose. You can't afford to lose any game. I agree. So you go into that game. You go into every game, including New Mexico. With that mindset. So it's either make the full switch to Reed or you don't. You have to give Reed the reps or you have to give Connor the reps. And both of them are young quarterbacks and both of them have their own issues that they need to fix. Yeah. And you got to give them the reps to fix them, whether we win or lose. No, I see. So, I, I agree with the concept, but I don't agree with the whether you win or lose part at this point in the game of the season. That's where that's where we that's where we differ. I, I don't think you afford yourself to make those kind of risky moves if you have a hot hand, even if it's not you know this diverse pass run attack. I think you have to do what it takes to win this game. I think it's that point in the season. I think we have that much riding on every game now. We can agree. To, we can agree to disagree. I, I no, but I see your point and I understand that. But at the end of the day, I'm not worried about just this week because this week is going to be the same thing when we go into Auburn. This week's going to be the same thing when we go into Texas. 
This week's going to be the same thing, and I'm knocking on wood and counting eggs ahead of time, and this will be a plus for me the first game of the playoffs. So we have to be able to get either Reed comfortable with the passing game and make sure he can hit the easy RPO run passes and get him into a rhythm that way so that way we can stick with him and keep going forward. Or we have to find a way to get Connor over his mental his mental mistakes. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with all of that. I just wouldn't jeopardize a hot hand to do that is what I'm saying. I wouldn't jeopardize if Reed's running all over the place. I'm not jeopardizing that. I hear your point. We can disagree on that on that aspect of it. But what else you got, Theo? Any closing thoughts? Um, just enjoy the ride and hit the likes. Thanks, man. I appreciate you. Know you. I am. Yes, sir. I know you are. I know you are. We all are, man. Thanks for thanks for being here, Theo. Have a great night. You're welcome, sir. You too. All right. Yeah, I mean, I like the concept. The only way I differ is, like, I'm not jeopardizing a game at the expense of that at this point in the year. I think every game is its own must-win scenario right now with what you have riding. And I think you cross those bridges when they come, but if you have a hot hand, you ride it. That's, that's, where, I, that's where I change. That's where I differ. But I like it. I like it. I like the different takes. Anyway, play to win. You're on with Drew. How you feeling, man? Drew, how you doing? I'm good. I'm still good. I'll be good yeah. the rest of the week until the next game. Then I'll be a, a wreck again. Yeah, that's it. We're all just be a bunch of wrecks. Mm -hmm. But uh, but I, I just want I want you to be you and do what you do. And if you want to cuss like a sailor and pop the top on some beers and you know kick back after you know uh, the game and we do the show and you just be just be Drew. I mean that's you know I love real. It's like uh, Ron White. Yeah, Ron White's real. I mean, he's, I mean, it's sometimes it's low vibe and it's cussing, but I mean, golly, he's so real, you know, I mean, that's, we like, and John Daly, he's real, Yeah. you know, he's a real guy. And, and uh, it, when he, he gives an interview, you're getting the real guy, you're getting the genuine Don, John Daly, you're getting yeah. the genuine Ron White, that, anyway. Yeah. So be you, you know, have fun, be you, pop the top on some beers, <laughs> you know, do a little, you know, do a little uh, Navy language. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 You saw a little bit of that after the game, didn't you? I did. Loved it. I yeah. loved it. I said, hey, I like that guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's like when that. I let loose. I'm. That's kind of how I am. There's a time and place for my different levels of, you know, looseness, I guess you would say. I think that's pretty true to myself. I think I keep it pretty, uh, you know, keep zipped, it real. zipped up. Yeah, I'll keep it real. I'll keep it real. I'll do it. I'll keep it going. Just keep being you, man. That's. I think we all do. We, we, love, we love real. And we want real. So that's good. Just keep doing what you're doing. We'll be fine. Hey, they're asking in the chat, did you call in the Tex Ags this morning? Yes, I did. Uh, yeah, uh, Asian Persuasion was there this morning. He said, good call. Oh, nice. I said, hey, yeah. it was good to have some one of our homies from from the Drew show, you know, uh, you know, chiming in there of the Tex Ags. And uh, I did get in on a phone call, and uh, they took it. Out, and, you know, I said, look, I look at it this way. The way I look at it is, I said, if if – South Carolina is strong on the run, but they're weak on the pass. Then I want to start. I want to start Connor. Okay, but if they're the other way around, if they're uh, strong on the pass and they're weak on the run, then I want to start Marcel because Marcel run all over him. Yeah, you know he, he would. You I mean in that situation? But then he came in and gave me some stats that I didn't have. I wasn't aware of. He said, okay, he said, well, South Carolina is number three when it comes to pass, when it comes to the rush defense. He said they're number three. They're only giving up about 100 more than yards, okay? And he said when it comes to can – I, uh, Can I comment on that before you move on? Yeah, go ahead. So they're what? They're giving up 103 yards per game? He said, yeah, that, he said they're number three in uh, rush defense, and they're only giving up 101 yards. Yeah, they're, I, 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 I noticed that too, and – they're good all around. Really, they are. I think they're pretty solid, and I think we would want to get into the game to see what decision you want to ultimately make with the quarterback, and I totally agree with that line of thinking. I will say this about the running attack. They have had the luxury of playing OU and LSU like we have to boost up those numbers a little bit, but they did show good run defense versus Bama, and that's a pretty similar look to Reed in Milrow. Right. Milrow's, Milrow's probably more, you know, just more seasoned, but yeah. yeah it's it's he, a good defense all around. Yeah, 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 most definitely. And then he got to uh, their pass defense is number five, and they're only giving up 196 yards. Good defense, man. 
Yeah, but here now here's the deal. These uh, against some of the teams that they played. Okay, we're talking about the offense of Old Dominion, Kentucky, Akron, Oklahoma. Okay, that are I think, on uh, you know they're a little bit more on the weak side, and we're coming in strong. We're going to be coming in strong in offense because Colin has the weapons. He knows how to use them. Oh yeah, we got it all. And they're, I think we're going to be the strongest offense they've seen this season so far. So that was a good point that he made. Those points, because I that, I was unaware of that. But how would you would you start Connor or would you start Marcel? Depending on if they're weak on the run, they're strong in the pass, and I would put in uh, Marcel if that's the case. But if they're, uh, they're weak on the pass and strong in the run, you put in Connor because Connor, I think, is our better passer. Yeah. So me, I'm starting with Reed because I really like Reed's poise and demeanor and just his gamesmanship. I really like those qualities about him. Now you can break apart the individual tools and say one stronger here, one stronger there. They're obviously very different quarterbacks. They're going to give you a totally different look, different options. I would start with Marcel because of the big game play, the ability to just, you know, make lemonade, like on the play where he pulled the handoff out. I like that stuff, and I want to see where he can build on that passing game. With Connor, I think we pretty much know he's not going to be the runner that Reed is. And I don't no. know. Do we, we, we probably know that Reed will never be quite the pocket passer or quite the passer that Connor is. But I do think Con- Reed has more upside in the areas where Connor is strong, if that makes any sense. Well, yeah, it does. I mean, and, and, and another thing, Marcel's pretty fair on both. Yeah. Okay, I mean, when he threw long to Noah Thomas, he hit him for like what fifty-seven yards or something downfield. I mean, it was, yep. a, I mean, like you said, a bucket pass. Boom. Yeah, yeah. It was right there. I mean, it was accurate. You know, so I think he's he's good on both. He's good on the rush. He's good on the pass. And you know, it's depending on what he has, because you only got about, like I said, an average of three seconds to do your reads, either yep. pass or run. Now he's quicker, definitely quicker than Connor. You know, trying to get out of the pocket and run. Connor can run, but he seems a little slower than Marcel. But you know what you could do is start Connor, and then if it bogs down again like Saturday night, you know, insert Marcel, you know, or in certain down situations where we've got to move the ball and put Marcel in. Hundred percent. And they got to, and they got, and South Carolina's got to prep for both. They're yeah. gonna have to prep for both quarterbacks. And then, oh yeah. And keep it a secret. I mean, until right at game time. And then, oh, uh, Connor's starting, or oh, Marcel's starting, and and I'm behind, uh, you know, Coach Elko, 100. Uh, percent I'm behind the coaching staff, Jay Bateman, uh, Colin Klein, whatever they decide to do, is I th- it's going to work, and it could be a trap game, but I think we have more than enough offense to generate points, you know, and special teams to, you know, if we need a few field goals. I mean, I, th- I think we're good for it. Uh, I think we're, you know, we're, we're, we're going to put a, we're, we'll have an output. I, I'm, I'm counting, uh, I'm counting the offense to generate probably four touchdowns. Okay. Okay. And special teams, at least one field go uh, to their, uh, probably us giving up 21 points to South Carolina. So I'm going to call it 31, 21 Aggies. All right. 30, 31, 21 Aggies. And uh, I just think we have, you know, we, we, we have more to offer from the offense. I mean, we we've got weapons. So, like I say, we they're probably we're probably gonna be the strongest offense that South Carolina's seen this season. Yeah, yeah, and like I said, I do lean Reed, but I'm totally on board with whatever this coaching staff decides to do. If they want to start Connor, if they think that's our best path to victory, I trust them. I, I tr- yes. they've earned our trust. They've made the right calls so far throughout the year. Hell, the quarterback situation, the way they've managed it, you can argue that's boosted us on the year, the way they've navigated it. So exactly. whatever they do, I'm on board. I'm still leaning Reed. That's just my take, and I totally respect yours with Connor, but we will maintain that they have the right to go to either one if the game dictates it. And, and another, another thing, Drew, I just want to say before we go off, uh, what Theo was talking about, I, I get where Theo's coming from, but one thing is, is – is for certain we've got to win the SEC games. We've got to beat South Carolina. New Mexico State, let's, I don't think we're going to lose against them, but if we were to lose against them, it's not an SEC conference That's true. law. Yeah. You know, yeah. we beat, but we've got to beat Auburn. We've got to beat Texas. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then that's our three SEC. So we stay strong and number one in the SEC, but we might fall in the polls, the AP top 25, 
if we lose against New Mexico State. Yeah. You know, but we want to definitely win our SEC conference games. I mean, it's just a must, you know. So, yeah. so hopefully we went out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's on yeah. the table. We only got four left. We'll see what happens. All right. Play to win, man. I appreciate it. You've made the rounds today. Tex Ags, now this little show. I appreciate you getting out there, man. Hey, dude, you're the show. I mean, you're. I, I like Josh Payton. I like watching him, and I've watched him for years. But now we got you. We got we got Drew Tamu, and you're our show. I mean, this this is it, man. You're you're the, you're the best in uh, talking Aggie football. I appreciate you it. Know, man. We, we, we come to your we come to your show. That's why we're here. Thank you, man. You have a great night. Hey, Can't wait to talk you to too. you next time. Have a good week. All right. All right. Nice words by Play to Win. Good question. Good point, Noble. I don't know if you can start Connor and keep pulling him. That's why I think if they're going to do that, and I think there's a good chance they do it, and they're, they're, they go into it willing to play both, there's going to be a conversation before the game. Just say, hey, we're going to see how this game goes. We're going to see how they're attacking us. Just expect to be subbed out. Expect that we're going to go there. It's just going to be another weapon of this offense, and I'm pretty sure they'll have that discussion this week. Who knows? They might be, okay, no, we're still going Connor. Okay, no, we're going Reed full blow. And the fact that we don't know, they don't know, that's a good thing. All right. Big Mac, you're on with Drew. How you feeling, man? What's up? How are you? I'm doing great, man. What's on your mind? So, uh, quarterback thing, I don't I don't think it really matters. I'm fine with whoever starts, like you said, and then they're gonna if they're gonna transition if it doesn't work out. Don't care. Yeah. I trust both guys. I th- I still think Connor's future NFL quarterback. I think if we start Marcel, Marcel keeps playing. Connor will transfer to a team that runs an offense that fits his style more and he'll light it up and he'll go to the NFL and he'll be great. He's like an NFL talent, no doubt in my mind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but as far as South Carolina, I think we're kind of immune to trap games, just being Aggies. <laughs> right. Right. We're just, like, there's no game that we go into where we're like, oh, we got this one. It's over. Yeah. We're going to, the BAS will kick in. We'll be nervous no matter what. Yep. Yeah, I'm super nervous. My my brother runs a he runs his own spreadsheet that he uses for betting, uh, and he's got A and M as a point four three favorite. And you know what? Um, Josh Pate's model has us as the underdog in the game. Yeah, it's terrifying. Yeah, it, it's a it's a real game. This is a challenge. This is a marquee matchup. They just don't have the record that or the ranking that shows that, but it's a real game. Yeah, they're good. I mean, on, honestly, offensively, they can't they can't really throw the ball very well. Right. Um. Like we're not a very good passing offense, and theirs is significantly worse than ours. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. But and then you know, I as far as like the quarterback for this game specifically, just start whoever, whatever it takes to win the game. I don't care. You got a bye week. You have New Mexico State after this. Figure it out then. Yeah, get through this, this is, game. Win this. You game. have to win this game. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's no doubt that you have to win this game. You have to do whatever it takes to win this game. If you have to put in. Jalen Henderson, or <laughs> fuck, we we have to put in Terry Bussey at quarterback. I don't care. Screw it, throw him out takes. there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. whatever it takes. So exactly. that's that's all I really care about. But I think I think our defense is going to eat in this game. I honestly think it's going to be thirty-one seventeen. There's, I'm gonna give, I'm gonna write that down for you so you're entered in the thing. But I, I think there's a path to domination defensively with their O-line situation, and that's a very yeah. that's a raw quarterback over there in Lenore Sellers. He's a good runner. He's had some good moments. He's never found consistency on the year. It's just, and he's getting sacked. They've given up like 23 sacks on the year. I mean, we're going to get after them. We're, we're going to yeah. make life hell for them. They have a good running back, but their O line doesn't really get a push. Yeah. And we've been, we've been, you know, we've played against running quarterbacks. We played against Arkansas. And, you know, we saw DJ Lagway. And I think we we're capable of handling that. Um, 100%. Yeah. It was crazy seeing, like, I don't know if it was necessarily a spy against Garrett Nussmeyer. I think it was just more of like a roamer. Yeah, right. Uh, but it was something kind of weird. I don't know what that was, but um, you mean I think that that we, feigned pressure where he drops back into? Yeah, it, it was like a feigned spy. pressure, and then yeah, he would either roam or he would kind of quarterback spy like what Cassius Howe did on that play that you showed earlier. Yeah, well, I think he was yeah. more in a true spy. Yeah, yeah, Nuss. I mean, I guess it's worth throwing a spy out there if you're gonna go into man or something because he has run for first downs. But well, yeah, they're gonna be ready for this. I mean, there's there's everything's on tape now you know what your team is you know what your opponent is at this point in the year they have the luxury of coming off a bye and adding wrinkles but they'll be ready yeah i honestly i think this game it'll probably be 14 14 at half and we're all gonna be freaking out oh dude and it's gonna end 31 17 i gotta say 
I don't know if it's anybody in the chat right now, but there have been some serious halftime freakouts on my watch party, and I see it. I know. I Man. know we freak out. It's part of this. It's part of the deal. I know. We, I've seen some pretty doom and gloom, but we've been a good second half team, man. Uh, yeah, all all year I've been I've been optimistic second half. Even the Notre Dame game, I was like, just from Elko being here as the DC, I was like, it's gonna be fine. Yeah. We're gonna figure it out in the second half. Yeah, from Arkansas to now, I think every game you've had some kind of fourth quarter moment or push. With the Missouri game, you had that goal line stand to end the game. Um, in this last game, obviously everything happened in the second half. Everything happened late. And yeah, man, it's a second half team. I would not be surprised to see that. Any closing thoughts, man? No, nah, man. I'm just. Uh, I just want to say that was probably top three greatest games I've ever been to at Kyle Field. Uh, 2010 versus Nebraska. That was the first time I was ever in Kyle Field. I think I was like nine years old, oh, nice. or maybe 12 years old, and uh, we won nine to six. Went to the Cotton Bowl. It was one of the greatest games I've ever been to. And then 21 against Alabama. Those were the loudest I've ever heard Kyle Field. Those three games. I think this game was probably the most consistently loud. Like those both had really loud moments. Yeah. But I think this was the most consistently loud throughout the entire game. I mean, my voice, I still don't have my voice and it's late <laughs> Tuesday night. Yeah, dude. I can't imagine being there. Yeah, I, I was here on the watch party. I could I could tell, man. We were screaming here, watching on TV. What an atmosphere, yeah. man. It was I'm a blast. I'm glad you enjoyed it. But yeah, I'll talk to you next time, Big Mac. I appreciate you. All right. Have a good one. Later. All right, guys. Uh, we have one caller waiting. One more person can get in if they want. One more person after Bob right here. TV camera was shaking. That was a crazy shot. I loved that. That was amazing. Hank says his voice still isn't back. I know, man. I'm one of those people that freaks out at halftime. I freak out all four quarters. I get it, man. We, we're emotionally tied to the team. But I saw some bad statements. I don't think anybody here was that. There was one that I had to mute for a while because it was depressing. But I get it. It's the sport. It's the sport we're in. It's the love we have for our school and the game. All right. Old Ag Bob, how you feeling, man? Feeling really good. Can you hear me? I just want to make sure I'm online. Got you loud and clear, man. All right. And I'll make sure that I'm on my phone. So I, last time, I, you're, I love your show, Drew. It's the only one I call into. You just... just you just nail it and um, you do a great job and you have a great call and great analysis. But, um, you I know, appreciate I, that. I, I go to one game a year and that's the game went to did some great tailgating game and, and it was just crazy. It was just outstanding and the camera shaking and it was so exciting. And even when we were performing the first half, there was still, it was still loud. It was still extremely loud and, yeah. and it was awesome. So let's, let's talk a little bit about um you know let's talk a little bit about this next game coming up and and i am sold that reed's going to start and if you look at that lsu game and why we didn't succeed the lsu front seven was crashing on into the line they were stuffing us because they really weren't worried about connor running and he didn't run it there were some i was watching some reviews and in and, and, and some plays and there was a big opening a left side and then he didn't run and and when reed's in there that pauses the the line rush right that pauses in fact on that first touchdown he scored that d that defensive end was just he was lost right i mean oh, if you yeah. if you look at it, he was just totally lost <laughs> so what and let's face it you know we struggle in the passing game why call it receivers call it whatever you want but what Reed's going to do is stretch the field. He's going to buy that extra half second, that extra second, which should give him some time and hopefully the receivers to get open. What do you think about that? I, I agree, man. And he's also going to force a spy. And, of course, that's going to you know limit what he can do running. But that takes away from their pass rush. It could potentially take away from their coverage. He makes you have to account for an extra body. And you're absolutely right. When Connor drops back to pass, you can get reckless. You can pin your ears back because he was not running well on the night. He was making bad decisions under pressure, and they were able to tee off, and we were missing a, a key piece in the pass-blocking realm, and I think that really showed. I think that affected Connor at left guard. But, no, you're, you're absolutely right. It, it causes the safeties to come up. It causes the safeties to pause in their coverage. It causes the nickel to look over. It just opens so many things up, and that's always the case with a running quarterback. But if he can hit passes, like the two he hit in the game, and he can build on that, I think it's clearly Reed, wouldn't it be? 
Yeah, I, I agree with you entirely. I mean, you've got to start Reed. If for that defense, I've been kind of doing some research, is effing good. It is. I mean that and it's just not it's not that dust at the line. They could, that I wish that freshman, you know they got deep uh, that defensive end that's it, outstanding. One of them's a freshman. Dylan Stewart, it, he's an alien man. Yeah. He, he's it's unreal. Incredible. So you have got the pause and you got to slow down that rush to give you time. Otherwise, you know, who's ever back there, they're going to stuff it and no room to run, you know, for running backs to run, no room to get out. So, you know, he scrambles, Reed scrambles. You you got to start Reed. Just, I know his accuracy is, in. but you know, what's really cool about Reed drew is if you listen to him in his interviews, the guy is really intellectual, articulate. I mean, he's not stumbling around. I mean, I mean, I guess that's just the interview, but he's on it. I mean, he's like under control. He talks like a future coach. He's very poised. He's very deliberate. And, you know, he's a coach's son. He was raised in a football family. And I'm sure Connor was too, to to a degree. But I I think that Reed does have an intangibles edge over Connor. And I I can pretty confidently say that by now. Yeah, I I, I agree with you. And so, I mean, you've got to to start Reed just to spread out that defense, to give – I mean, that defense is really, really good. Our defense is getting better and better every day. They fought in. They're they're trained real well. And they're getting coached up better and better and better. I think they get it yeah. from where they were at the beginning of the year. And um, and I'm I'm going to tell you what this the, the, if you look how South Carolina stays in games with a horrible offense. I mean, we're, <laughs> yeah. I can't wait to see what Elko and. I mean, who, who's, I'm sorry, who's our DC? Bateman. Yeah, Bateman. But Elko's obviously a defensive guy. Yeah. I can't wait to see what they dial up for that that offense. I oh. mean, they are, they are going to dial up some stuff that's going to, she's just going to go, wow. I mean, because their guys are big, but they're slow. They're, I was listening to actually a South Carolina um, sports commentator today on, on a show, and he even like was going, wow, you know. That offensive line is shaky. It, yeah. It's shaky. I mean, and then you got a true freshman or a redshirt freshman. I don't, is he true freshman or redshirt freshman? He's a redshirt. Yeah, I mean, he's 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 hold. He, they were saying he holds the ball too long. I can't wait to see what we dial up. But I'm going to tell you what the difference in this game is going to be. Is us not making any turnovers? Oh yeah, that is going to be the difference. What's kept South Carolina in all these games is that fantastic defense of theirs making, you know, getting turnovers and having short fields. And if we don't make any turn turnovers and we control the ball, even if, you know, it's frustrating, we're going to win this game. I agree. And they force turnovers. They get a lot of interceptions. They get a lot of stuff by flustering quarterbacks and flushing them out. But a great thing about Reed that lends towards his argument is that under pressure, he doesn't turn it over. He runs, he'll take a sack, he'll throw the ball away, but he doesn't give it away. And that, yep. you're absolutely right. That is exactly what South Carolina has done to stay in games. They've got they've made big, wacky plays on special teams. They get turnovers. They eventually chip away on offense. They get short fields, and they're able to score. And you made a point about how this defense is learning. Look, they're doing some fancy stuff with this defense, man. They're showing pressure. They're bringing pressure from other places. They're showing man coverage, dropping into zone. You got to have players who are able to process and learn and do that stuff. And they're doing it, man. Major they're credit. buying. They're buying in. They have bought in. Not buying in. They have bought in. I was watching this other podcast, and and um, and it, these guys were national levels. And he was there before the season started. And he was with Elko, and it was this. This guy was being interviewed by uh, ESPN, and um, you know he. I forget who's the name of the guy, the ESPN, the tall, skinny guy, that um, he's super popular. Was I love. The, are you talking about the the Van Pelt and Stanford yeah. Steve Stanford Steve interview? Yeah, exactly. And he said he was there, and they were talking about it. And he said the defensive line guys were arguing. <laughs> they, you know, the offense guys weren't taking it seriously, and then. Elko coached, coached him, and they were going out on Thursday nights. And then Elko talked to him, and then he went, "I was there, and I can't say anything." But those guys were not; those players were not going out on Thursday night. Did you catch that? Yeah, I heard him say that, and he also said that Elko talked to Steve Stanford. Stanford Steve, he's on game day, the bald guy. If you guys don't know, 
Um, and he said that Elko told him that we're trying to get bad habits out of this team. That's our biggest exactly. goal right now. It's getting bad habits out of this team, like going out on a Thursday night, being undisciplined, being unfocused. He said that was their main goal early in the year. And it seems like they've already done that. Yep, I, they're getting out of it. And what I love, too, is the props to our uh, strength and conditioning coach. Oh, I, yeah. I hear that every week. I hear that every week. It's somebody references this guy in the background who is getting these. Because, you know, I'm old ag Bob. I saw so when Manziel was playing and that I know it was great to watch him, but we lost so many games in the second half because we, they just weren't in condition. They, even, we, even we were ahead at halftime so many games. Yeah. Yeah. Even with Jimbo, I felt like the last couple of years, maybe we weren't ahead at halftime, but I felt like we were the team that would make the big mistakes late in games. We weren't the teams that were able to execute late in games. And that falls back on conditioning quite often. You have to be able to keep your mind in the game and tired players don't make the best decisions. So huge credit to Tommy Moffitt. I mean, crazy thing about Tommy Moffitt is that he was the first coach let go by Brian Kelly when he took over at LSU. He wanted to bring his own guy in. It wasn't like he went to go fire him. But it's crazy because he won three championships with three different coaches at LSU. And now he's here. And now we're reaping the benefits of that. And it's, it's huge credit to him. And, and you, you can see it. I mean, how many times – I know – you know, the strategy is run the ball and they wear it down. But how many fourth quarters have we just dominated? I, I mean, just took taken over and run it down their throats. I know. I know, man. Arkansas, this game, Missouri, it's been awesome. Yeah. So, but Connor, you know, love the guy. He's got head issues, man. I mean, <laughs> something, so he's just too quick. I mean, it's like, he, it, some, if, if, you almost need to give him a barbiturate for the game or something because he, he's probably back there so wired up and so, you know, so tense that Elko said in his interview, he needs like a thousand reps, right? To just like get in the flow of the game. And, you know, the, the, and, and Elko also said, you know, the, the ends aren't getting to their spots quick enough. Well, what do you do? Put Reed in there so those guys can get to those spots, you know, to give by that half second or so. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it does seem like Connor is pressing. It does seem like Connor is coming into games a little bit, you know, in his head. And I don't know what fixes that. He has injury history, the foot. He's a big deal. He's coming off of it. And Elko's acknowledged that's that's something that's still with him. He At least in the Notre Dame game it was. And now, I don't know. I, I don't want to speculate too much what's going on with Connor, but it definitely seems like he plays a little bit sped up. A little bit sped up. Yep, I agree 100%. Well, I love your show. I and the old Ag Bob from '78. Whoop! And uh, nice. and I was there. I, I go to one game a year. I'm from Houston. Uh, sorry, Rockets did it to you. Yeah. And yep. <laughs> and uh, it was just insane in that stadium that night. I what was really impressive to me is how the crowd continued just yelling even when we weren't really performing in the first half. And then. When we got that first interception, it Exploded. just, the lid went off. The lid imagine. just went off. How loud I mean, was it? Just ear ringingly loud. Just, you know, can't think. It was, it was, I would not want to have been on that field. I would not have been. <laughs> and I'll, I'll leave you this. Love your show. How happy are we? We don't have stoops. Oh, gosh, <laughs> I know, man. The 12th man did a solid there. Cause they, he was all but hired, man. Oh yeah. I got, I, I, I don't want to say this, but I got a friend who, uh, is one of the, the key guys that was, you know, when the new stadium was, he had, he was one of the 12 people down there with a shovel dig and he's, oh, nice. he's and, and, and he, he actually played and he's a great guy, made a ton of money and, and energy trading, which is, I come from. And, um, and it was like, you know, I'm just, he, he was one of the guys that like, no, we're not going for stoops. We're not, we're stopping this. We're stopping this yeah, right now. Yeah. That's awesome. That's and, we, uh, we made a stand and that AD is gone. Can you imagine we get stoops, and then the AD is gone. That That's such a disaster situation. And look at Kentucky this year. Yes, exactly. Exactly. I, I mean, it's like, you know, El Elko, you know, we wasn't talking about Fisher or anything, but what Elko's talking about is he's a football coach. He, you know, he's not, he's not hype. I mean, some of these guys are hype. He's, I don't want, you know, Saban is a, an analogy that's really big to compare to, but you know, he, he goes in there and he, and he talks football. He talks and he's not, you know, the politician type guy. And, and he's, and that's just solid. I mean, I don't know. 
you maybe you talked about this, but somebody actually said one of the players or something or somebody said then when he goes into the, on the sidelines, he doesn't even need a card. He knows all the plays. It's a, it's, he knows everything that's going on. The guy's a football wizard. He really is, man. He, he's, I mean, Ivy Leaguer, he, he's a real football guy. This is it. It's substance. It's not style. It's work. It's rolling your sleeves up. That's all he is. And I, I think players are going to want to be a part of that, especially yeah. now that they're seeing the results. So I think the best is yet to come. We already saw recruiting take off after yeah. the weekend. We're trending well for a lot of players that we weren't trending well for before. And I think we're really just rounding a corner with this guy, man. It's, yeah. it's, it's awesome. I have one uh, piece of advice for uh, Coach Elko in the offseason. Ozempic. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. Look. I'm for whatever makes him happy. Keep doing what you're doing. Don't change a damn thing. That's where I am. If Elko, Notice I, if, I said the off season. <laughs> off season, right, right. Don't mess with the mojo. Look, if the belly's part of the mojo, I'm for the belly. I'm for the barbecue, the fajitas, whatever he needs. Yeah. I, so I'm taking. I'm saying. I think. I'm. I'm thinking we're gonna hold these. Um, you know, no turnovers. I'm going 21-10, low scoring game because, is is we 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 have to be patient. This game, you got a lot of young kids. How many times does Elko say, I got 18 to 23 year olds, 18 to 23 year olds? But we got to be patient. It's going to be a low starting game. They got a great defense, 21 13, something like that. Yep. I think I'm going to be pretty low scoring when mine comes up. But all right, Bob, I appreciate the call, man. Hope to hear right. from back from you in the future. Have a good night. Great show. Thanks. Thank you. God, hit, hit Elko right in the Ozempic. I'm, I think Elko is beautiful. I think Elko is great the way he is. I think he looks like a football guy. I want him to hit the buffets all he wants, just like I am. All right. Looks like we have no more callers waiting. If Jeb wants to call in, I know he wanted a rant or something. If not, if you all have any questions in the chat, I have a few more minutes I can go. If you want, me, if you want to get me talking about anything, throw it in the chat right now. Fancy Texas says, love that Duncan piece. Who made it? The guy should have put his name on it because this is a custom. It's like a local guy who makes these. It's my favorite um, professional athlete role model ever. I love Tim Duncan. Jeb, what you got, man? <laughs> What's up, man? Uh, Wait, you're not watching Hocus Pocus? What happened to your plans? Well, yeah, my, my parents are here in town from Washington. So after after this after this call in, I'm definitely going to watch Hocus Pocus with my mom. Nice. <laughs> how, was the, uh, how was the Spurs game? It was all right. I had a good time going, but we freaking lost to the Rockets. So I'm going. I think I'm going in December when they play the Kings. Nice. It's, it'll be my. It'll be my first time going ever. You've never been to a Spurs game? I've never. I I grew up a Spurs fan, ironically, but I've never been to a game. Dude, enjoy it. They're fun, man. Especially when the Spurs are playing well. The the buildings rocking. They they're in a good place right now. They're not going to be consistent. Hopefully, you catch. Them yeah, on a good I figured. Night. I mean, they're they're still rebuilding. I was going to ask you, like, is it is the parking still a pain, just like every stadium, or? Just bring 25 bucks and it's not bad. 25 bucks. Okay. Okay. And but I'll yeah, say this, it, my, my fiance and I, we run out of the stadium because the traffic leaving is pretty bad. Oh yeah. I, I, I mean, that's every yeah. uh, game, right? So absolutely, man, going to college station though, dude, I have it locked down. <laughs> oh, you have your, you have like your system where you park. You I have my there. system, man, every time. So basically my, me and my buddy, he has a van and we just bring our bikes and we park in a lot for like 20 bucks, kind of like down from Northgate. Yeah. And we just, I think it's a new lot actually, because I've never seen it. And Dude, don't tell the secrets. You can't tell. Oh, the yeah. Secrets. Sorry. I mean, I get, we get there. We usually spend the whole day in College Station before the game. Yeah. That's but we got to, we park, we, we park at like two o'clock. Then yeah. we just kind of go to Northgate, we drink, and then we ride our bikes to the state, which is like a five minute bike, dude. Yeah. And then when we leave to go, like, when we leave, there's like no traffic. So, yeah, dude, I, I, do, job, I, I do something very similarly. I cannot give the actual secrets, but I'll say this. Since graduating, I have never dealt with traffic leaving an AM game. I'll leave it at that. Oh, dude, it's perfect, man. Because it's it's genius because you got Northgate. If you want to drink, you got Northgate right there and the stadium's just right there. The bike ride, because it's I mean, College Station's pretty flat. Yeah. So it's Biking's definitely easy. Yeah, dude. But, some of these campuses are rough. I went to Clemson for our game a few years back, 2019. That's a hilly campus. You can't even see the stadium. <laughs> it's in a valley and it's like a workout just walking around. It's nice to have a wow, flat, damn, flat campus. Dude, you've yeah. been all around. Yeah, I mean, I, I wish I could relive the game, man. It was probably my favorite game I've ever been to so far. Dude, because dude, when the game started, game, I was dead. Everything. I was dead, man. Like I was just my energy was just completely shot. I was you like, were that dude. drunk? 
Well, I was kind of drunk too. I had a couple of Red Bull vodkas, <laughs> just but up. they were really I, cheap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to take them. But I mean, like, you. I was just taking it out of the game because, like, I mean, we weren't doing it. I was like, dude, are we, are we about to get blown out? I know. Like, really, man? We should, we get, we should, I was like, dude, after, if we would have lost that game, I was going to be like, I got to stop going. <laughs> you're, Every you're time I luck. go, man, we lose. Yeah. Dude, the crazy thing is I felt exactly how you were feeling, like, at halftime, beginning of the third quarter. It's insane how quickly that game turned around. We were down in the game, lifeless. In literally 20, like, real-time minutes, not game minutes, 20 minutes later, we were up two scores. Oh, and, yeah, and no, I was talking to this world. guy next to me. He was pretty cool. But I was like, dude, watch. Elko, he's usually really good at second half adjustments. And I'm like, we just need a turnover, man. If we can just get one turnover, this game's going to flip. Yeah. And and it, and it did. And the guy next to me was calling him, man. He was like, we need to put in Marceau. We need to put in Marceau. I was like, yeah, maybe so, man, because he's just – I know LSU, they were playing aggressive. They were blitzing a lot, on, th especially on third downs. They, I mean, they made it known they were going to blitz every time. And they, man, they were just getting pressure. And uh, it was the right call. Um, yeah, yeah, I, man, I, I was defending it, Connor. I mean, Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I was, you know, obviously after the game, I like to watch all the post-game shows, see what the other fans are saying, you know, just the football fan in you. Of course. And, man, dude, people are still not – I mean, not saying we demand respect, but people are still doubting us, man. It, it blows my mind. I know. It's crazy. We got to rip I, no, it. No way I thought we were going to score 30 points. I'm like, it's going to be a one-possession game probably in the 20s. Never watched me to 31-6 to six run. It's like, dude, come on. Just hey, say did it. you realize – Remember when we kind of like blew them out in 2022, like surprising? Yeah, it was the same score, right? 38 20. It was 38 to 17 with like six minutes to go. Same score. Same exact score. That's so funny. 38 to 23. That game felt like a blowout. This game didn't really feel like a blowout while it was happening, but you get the same outcome. You win by 15 points. I mean, oh, do I won in the score 40 when they when they called that for the targeting call and they called the, you know, the, the play back from like the one yard line? I was like, dude, I just want to score 40 points, 42 to 23. I want to blow these. These losers out. Yeah. I oh, dude, everything we talked about about Nuss. Listen, I like Nussmeyer. I think he's a good quarterback. He's a great quarterback. But they ask him to do too much. I mean, when you throw 50, 60 times a game, you're going you're gonna to turn the ball over. Yeah. And nobody was saying that. Nobody was talking about that on all these sports analysts and all these popular guys. It's like before the game, they were gassing up. You know, Nussmeyer, he was the reason why they chose them, you know, to beat a &M. And they were gassing him up, saying all these things. And then as soon as he loses, it's, oh, well, he, he's always been reckless, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, come on, man. I know. Like, where was that before? If, if you would, I think against Old Miss, he was like, what, 22 of 50? They couldn't run against us. They had to abandon yeah. the run. And then they're down in the game. They have to pass. They're only going to pass. And we just pinned our years back. They didn't even try to run the ball. Up. And no one talked about that. It's like, dude, you're not going to beat a lot of very good teams going down the road if you can't run the football, which is very foreign for LSU because they're known for their running backs and their running game. And I talked about I before the game. This is exactly what happened to them versus Ole Miss, except Ole Miss couldn't make Nuss pay. Nuss, that was like a 52 passing to 20 rushing game against Ole Miss. I said, if this game becomes close, if this is a game where LSU has to score, they're only going to pass. And that proved to be true because they cannot run oh, yeah. against the I defense mean, like ours. Our DBs aren't perfect, but they're good enough. They're good enough they're for sure. damn well good enough. Look, they, gave, you, they got some plays, some big plays off of missed tackles, 73 yards off of a missed tackle. And there was another play in there. Nuss made some good plays in the game. They're good pass. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I know that one guy was Aaron Anderson. He, he was carving us up. I don't know why they didn't stop throwing the slants to him because he was killing us in the middle yeah. for a little while. Yeah, and they yeah. went away from that. And, and, um, yeah, man, but I've been watching all these shows, especially if you guys watch like the Blake Delfino and the Joe show. One oh. guy's a big LSU fan. Like he's a big Notre Dame fan. Yeah. Man, dude, there you can tell he was he was definitely coping, man. I mean, he said the same thing you were saying about all the other fans. They were just going on about how we didn't beat them. LSU just beat themselves, and it's like it's a pretty pathetic dude. take. And now everyone's super confident that South Carolina's take. I get gonna it. beat us. Yeah, I've, yeah. People and are now everyone's them. super confident South Carolina's gonna beat us. It's like what? Yeah, yeah, I know. I Listen, know. like South Carolina, they're they're kind of like us from last year. They have a really good defense. But their offense is bad. Yeah, I've I've watched all their games. Yes, they have two very good pass rushers. They are scary on defense. Them playing at home is scary. But we're an all-around better football team than they are. The only way South Carolina wins this game 
is if they get off to a fast start like they did in 22. If they jump out to like a 17-0 lead in the in the first quarter, Gotta which I don't fast. see that happening. Yeah, yeah. I think Elko has these guys focused up. If this game is close and if, if it's one position game going to the fourth quarter, we're going to wear them out. Yeah. I don't care how good your defense is. Your defense can be great, but if you have no offense, you're not going to win very many games. Yeah. Especially in an offensive league. So it's like if South Carolina, who has a probably below average offense, bad offensive line, young, experienced quarterback, not a ton of good weapons on offense. They got some good guys, but nothing really scary that we haven't seen. Yeah. If we if we suffocate if we suffocate their offense, I mean, how, how I just I don't get it, man. Like, I don't get it. I don't get it either. And we're gonna we gotta win this freaking game, man. Oh yeah, I've been, I've been, I've been a keyboard He's I've been a keyboard You're warrior all all week long, man. I've been arguing with South Carolina fans. I mean, I usually don't like to do that, but you know, I've been kind of feeling myself lately with this win. Those South Carolina fans, man, they're, they're, confident. they're feeling very confident. It's like, yeah, you guys are, you know, you're a gritty team, but you are what your record is. You're four and three. You don't have any quality wins. Yeah, you could say you played those those teams hard, but you still lost. Yeah. Good teams find a way to win. Bad teams find a way to lose. I'll say this. Every team's confident. Mississippi State was freaking confident. Arkansas oh, yeah. I was confident. LSU was Dude, confident. Dude, everyone keeps – listen, I love that everyone keeps picking against us. They said the same thing now for six weeks. Oh, Florida, the swamp. Everyone chose Florida. Yep. Blew them out pretty much. Everyone chose Arkansas. Oh, they're a better team now. I think this is the year. Arkansas should be undefeated. We beat Arkansas with a backup quarterback. Missouri, top 10 team. I think Missouri's going to take them down. Whoop their ass. LSU's got nut. Or Mississippi State, they're a scary team because they've been problematic for us. Away, oh, we, we beat them by double di- by double digits. LSU has Nussmeyer. They're, they're hot. They're playing really well. Oh, we, we whoop them, and it's just like, man, the, dude, the bias against a and is very real. It, if you watch these shows, if you watch, like, On 3 and stuff like that, dude, it, it pains them to say it. It pains them to say that A&M's actually pretty good. I know. I one know. guy even said we're not the best – one guy even said we're not even the best team in the SEC, which, I mean, you can make an argument for Georgia, but I think we could beat Alabama and LSU. I mean, Alabama and Tennessee. I think we can too. I, I think honestly, I think Tennessee should be ranked behind Notre Dame and A and M. Oh yeah, I think it's fair I, I to move Nader, Notre Dame up with A and M. I think that's fair because they've been winning, they've been looking good. But Absolutely, I think we should be ahead of Tennessee. I think so too. Where are their wins? What are their best wins? The Alabama win. Uh yeah okay. yeah okay we have but Alabama I mean they play LSU in a couple of weeks. Oh yeah, that'll be good. Who how's how's that one looking? I have no idea. I would. Honestly, probably pick LSU right now. I oh, but yeah, man. Every everything, all these analysts are saying that we're confident about LSU winning, about how their defense is playing better and us. Now, now they're turning to switch. Oh well, LSU, their defense isn't that good. You know, they're, <laughs> they're downplaying the win, man. I don't. I know it bothers. It just bothers me, man. So we lose one game. A and M was pretend they played all these shitty they're, teams. Oh, they're but you you know darn well a thousand percent. If LSU won that game, they would go on and on about LSU. Oh, they're an elite team. They they can make it far in the playoffs. And that's just going to be this NFL quarterback. You know darn well if they would have won, they would have gone on and on and on about them. Okay, here are the teams we should be ahead of right now. Looking at the polls, <laughs> so we have Tennessee, Texas, um, Notre Dame. All teams in front of us with the same record, and Ohio State. If we're being fair, and we're not looking at you know poll friction, yeah, based on strength of wins versus and your strength of losses, A and M and Notre Dame should be ahead of Tennessee and Texas. Yeah, I, I think as of right now, I, okay. So it's funny how and I maybe say, even Clemson. Clemson has a stronger loss, but they don't have any quality wins. No. Texas, I mean, they don't have any quality. I mean, do they have quality wins? Not really. Texas doesn't. Yeah, I mean, I know. So it's crazy. I remember, you know, after that Bowling Green game, I was like sitting in my room. I was like, man, if we were to play Texas tomorrow, we'd probably get blown out. Yeah. But now I'm at the point now, dude, I'm feeling so good we play them at home in November. If it's a night game, especially if it's a night game, dude, I'm feeling so good about playing them. I'm not saying anything until we're there, but yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna talk, but I'm saying like I feel a lot better now than I do like week three or four. Yeah. Oh yeah, dude. I mean, we're getting. Oh, you're going. You're better. going to the game. You're going to the game though, right? I'll be at the Texas game, man. Uh, oh, dude, my I want to go. So my heart bad. is gonna. I'm gonna have a heart attack. I'm gonna die in that game. If my parents aren't here for Thanksgiving, like if they leave dude. early, I might go out. I might go out to Austin and watch the game. Jeb, 
I'm literally going to die watching that game. My, my heart is going to constrict. Like, bring, a, bring a defibrillator. I need to. Right? Bring, I need an O2 to. Tank. I need like beta blockers or something. Before the, like when I'm there sitting, I'm always the most nervous when I'm at games. Like the Notre Dame game, I got there like an hour early in my seat. I'm like unwell in my seat. I'm like rocking. I'm like, I'm getting anxiety, dude. It's just. Have you ever, so let me ask you a question. I know this is kind of irrelevant. Have you ever like gone to the game and someone's always sitting in the wrong section? <laughs> yeah. Dude. It's it annoying. happens to me every single time. I, so I, oh, dude, it makes me so mad. I hate the bleachers when that happens because you're like cheek to cheek and it's like yeah, sardines. Yeah, basically. Oh, it pisses so, me off. This, so funny story. This is kind of a funny story. We're at the game. The game's already started. And I, I, we're all thinking we're on the right seats, right? And this guy and his daughter just come out of nowhere. Like the game's already like, been like 20 minutes started. He comes out of nowhere, has his two kids, and he sits. And so these two dudes next to us, they're pretty much in our laps. Ugh. And we're like, someone, they thought we were in the wrong seats. And I was like, are we in, Are we the assholes? Are we in the wrong seats? And we found out they were in the wrong seats. And it's like the whole time. And obviously they, they found a spot, but it's just like. Okay, are you the guy to go get the usher? Like, are you going to be the snitch? I always hate to be the snitch. No, I, I don't do it, but I, I almost had this lady do it. Oh uh, Yeah, I almost <laughs> had my fiance do it for the Bama game last year. I was like, I can't, man. I because the dudes next to us were cool. I mean, they were young, you know. They were probably around our age and our, you know, late twenties. Yeah. And they, you know, they were cool. So it's like we were telling them, it's like because I was telling the people, uh, there was like a gap down the like aisle from us, and I was telling people down, can y'all scoot down? But the guy next to us had like padding in his like bleachers. Yeah. And so he's like, I'm not moving, and I was like, Oh. <laughs> oh my god. Well, that, I was like, okay. And the guy didn't even stay for the whole – dude, he left at like halftime. Did you steal his padding? Oh, yeah. Dude, you want to hear something crazy? This is such an off-the-wall story. I went to the Bama game in 2016 at Bama, first year of the playoff. We were ranked four. They were ranked one. Oh, yeah. After the game, the buddy I went with – I went with like a group of Aggies, like six of us. Yeah. My, we're all, you know, pretty toasty off the off the, off the the at the time Bud Lights. And he starts eating – all these nachos that were left behind by the crowd. There's a bunch of nachos under the bleachers. <laughs> and he just goes, he's like, dude, I'm hungry. And he starts eating people's leftover nachos. He's like, oh, that one, dude, has, that no one has jalapenos. Way. He's like, that one has jalapenos. And he goes and starts eating that one. I'm like, dude, you're a sick freak. That's sick bastard. I mean, think about it. That food, that was probably $20 nachos. That was expensive nachos. And he got a good deal on those nachos. But he probably oh, also dude, I bought got, two. you know, so the flu or something. I, I told myself I wouldn't buy drinks at the game we just because we just drank at Northgate. I, I ended up doing it, but I was like, I spent like 30 bucks on like two Millers, and I'm like, dude, why did I fucking do this? It's not worth it. It's not it's worth not, it. It's not worth it at all. I didn't even get a good buzz out of it. Well, you know my you know my philosophy. I don't drink during A&M games anymore. I did it one time. I was at the game. I had, I think, yeah, I wasn't a student anymore. It was, Ar- it was um, what was it? Auburn 2019, the game we lost. That was the one game we should have won that year that we didn't. Every other game that year was like versus rank two and like Jamar Chase, LSU or whatever. And yeah. I was, I was drunk, very drunk. I was pissed off. I was a terrible Aggie. I was already calling for Jimbo's head and I was five years early and I felt bad. Are about you it. Are you like one of those like aggressive drunks though where you're just yelling out shit? Not <laughs> typically, but apparently when I'm mad at a and I am. And so I've never done it again. I don't think I've ever had that problem. I don't, I don't like getting drunk anymore. Obviously, as you get older, the hangovers get worse. Yes. But I, I've always been a good drunk. I've always been lighthearted. Yeah. Uh, I like a good buzz, but, dude, actually, last time I was in San Antonio, I think I have PTSD from drinking, man. I drank <laughs> way too much, dude. Too many way frozen, t- I, frozen margaritas? I had, so many, I had so many margaritas, so many sangrias. <laughs> and, dude, like, I, I was feeling so good, and it just all hit me at night. And, dude, it took me two days to recover. Have you heard of cheese buzz? Uh-uh. Dude, it's a problem. San Antonio has this virus brew, and it's called Cheese Buzz. They're margaritas. Oh, really? It's a margarita, like a frozen skin, not frozen, a skinny on the rocks, but they add Everclear to that sucker. They add Everclear? They add Everclear <laughs> to it. It's like, what are you trying to do, man? And a lot of my buddies like them. I like the name of it, too, man. I like the accent. Cheese Buzz. With it. Cheese Buzz. Yeah, they actually have shirts that say, I'll have a Cheese Buzz, please. Yeah, next time I come to San Antonio, I'll definitely need to ask you, like, what are some good spots outside? Yeah. Let me know, of, man. Uh, Let me know. I will. But, yeah, man, I, I had to rain a little bit. I was like, dude, it was eating me up inside. I, I, I usually don't get heated. I, I usually don't get really heated very often, but – Watching all these post comments, I'm like, dude, the disrespect. People just hate to see us win. I mean, I, I'm okay with it, obviously, because it's like people are just jealous. Yeah. But I, I, I love, 
I see all the UT fans aren't talking really all that much though. Here's what you, yeah, here they they've gotten really quiet. They got real quiet. Okay, but here's what you don't do: when you hear an opposing fan say, "Oh, they didn't win this; we lost it." You don't put any stock in that. That is coping. That is copium. Yeah, that's what I called it. I commented that on every single one. I was like, "This is just cope, man." Like, just give your, I mean, just give your respect to say, "Hey, you know, the better team won." They whooped our ass in the second half. They're like, well, in the first two quarters, we were whooping their ass. Yeah, but football's a four-quarter game, dude. Yeah. You can play well in the first quarter all you want. I've seen teams – I've seen games where games were close, and then by second half, it's a blowout. So you just never know. Yeah, yeah. All and, right. uh, yeah. Jeb, we went off the rails there, but that was the last call. Thank you. <laughs> I, I had to get it out there. I had to get that long out. Hopefully everyone – Hopefully everyone enjoyed that. So yeah, I like it. I like it. I like ending the show. Are you li- are you uh, live streaming the show this weekend? Yeah, I'll be watch party for the game. Anybody wants to come by? Are you doing it at it's six thirty, right? The game's at six thirty. I'll probably jump on six. I'll look Dude, at the. They slate. did that shit on. They did that shit on purpose. They wanted it to be at six thirty. It's gonna be crazy. <laughs> they That's... wanted it to be a night game so we could possibly projectly get upset. Yeah. Oh, I but know. I th- I mean Aggie fans, you guys should feel good. I mean, this is a great team. This is not the same team. They they keep bringing the twenty two game up. Okay, that was twenty two. We were a, this is that was a way worse team than this year's team. Okay, it was. I, I I'll be surprised if, if South Carolina gets into a hot start like that right off the gate. I don't think it's gonna happen. I know we can't let that happen, but I don't think it happens. Yeah, that's the only way they can beat us. The only way they can beat us. I mean, you never know, but the only way they can beat us, they need to I find a lead. Won't... They need to get an early lead because it'll be get harder like a 14, for us. Three. To get they have back to get. But it. I think if we go up two scores, I think that's game. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It works both ways. I think an early lead in this game is lethal with the defense. I'm gonna get my there. score prediction because I don't think I, I, I might not call it on Thursday. Right, what you're you still got? Doing that, yeah. Still doing a show on Thursday. Yeah. I think it's gonna be low scoring. I can see. I'm gonna. I'm gonna be bold here. I'm gonna go. Tw- I'm gonna go 24 to three. 24 to three. So we hold them to a field goal. I think we shut them out at their own home. It could be like. I, I wanted to say 24 10. But I think I think twenty four three man. I wouldn't call it crazy. I wouldn't call it impossible. Because I mean, I'll be shocked if we score more than thirty points on their defense. Because they so do have I. a very good defense. So would I. And I do feel like the offense is trending in the right direction. Totally for A and M. It is. It is. But I don't, there's I still mean, question marks. It's still not perfect. Yeah, yeah. I think um, our pack. Obviously, the pass game has to be consistent. I, but I think Thomas and Barber are becoming those guys. I know people are talking about the quarterback controversy right now, but it's just like after seeing Saturday, how could you not start Reed? Like, yeah. I I get it. You want to play chess games with the with the next team, you know, get, keep them guessing. But it's like, you know, Reed's just so much more poised, and he doesn't turn the ball over. And when you're poised and you don't turn the ball over, it's recipe for wins. Yeah, Connor, I don't know if he's just feeling the pressure of like maybe Reed over his shoulder. Kind of like how Ewers is with uh, Manning, you know. Mm. Um, I don't know, but dude, it's just like <sighs> there's still people out there that thinks Connor should start, but it's like, dude, South Carolina has two elite edge rushers. If they get pressure on, on on him again and they rattle him, it might be disastrous. Especially this is a way game this time. Yeah. So it's like, I, I I don't know. I mean, versus a defense that's probably much better than LSU. So it's like. I don't know. I mean, at least we, if you have Reed, they're not going to play aggressive. They're not going to just blitz guys off the edge constantly and hope for a sack. If you blitz Reed, you better get home. Yeah, absolutely. So, I I mean, if, if you're a South Carolina, you want Connor to start. Yeah. Oh, that's, <laughs> I would. That's what their uh, their fans have been saying. That's what their, you want Connor their, that's to start what their media has been saying. He He's just – I don't know what his deal is, man. Like, I mean, like I said, I, I like Connor. He seems like a great dude. Maybe maybe people are right, you know. Maybe he doesn't fit the system. Maybe he's overthinking. I don't know. He can't do. He's at, that's like three bad games. I mean, what more, what more evidence do you need? Yeah, look, you know, I'll, like, I'll still I'll still revert to the fact that I trust the coaching staff, even if it's Connor. Yeah, exactly. Gonna, we're not. I'm coaches. not going to be mad at all. <laughs> if we were coaches, we'd be. We, yeah, exactly. You got to trust Elko. So, but yeah. it's like. Come on, man! Like he's had he's had three pretty bad games. If if Connor stays in the LSU game, we probably get blown out. It's tough, you know. I would I would push back a little bit because you got the ball at the ten yard line. I don't know. Does Connor? Score okay, yeah, that that's di- that's different. That's different for sure. And that did help a lot. Obviously, those turnovers gave us a short field. 
Yeah, it was nice because I know LSU fans were saying that, that that's their excuse as well. They were giving short fields, so any quarterback is going to score when you give him a short field. Not necessarily. Yeah, you know. And what about the time where Reed threw that bomb to Noah? Yeah, yeah. They drove, dude. So I was sitting right by that when that happened when he threw it. And I could see the whole thing. It was crazy, man, because when he threw the ball, I thought it was going to be overthrown because I think Gilbert came kind of late and kind of jammed it a little bit. Gilbert was, was behind like, on the play, but he had to get it over Gilbert. He had to throw it as yeah, far yeah. as, and I as, far it as on, Noah I, could reach you, it. You were watching the, like, you know, the, you know, the, you watched on your phone or TV or whatever. And dude, it was a beautiful pass. It was, it was, I mean, I, I, it's there. I mean, I just, like I said, I, I think Reed has to be your guy right now until, until otherwise, until, unless you're getting like blown out. And you can make the quarterback change. Yeah, I, I think I think you keep the leash short enough to where you don't have to be being blown out to put the other guy in. That's that's my opinion. I think it has to be a shorter leash than you normally would have with an established starter, given our situation. Oh yeah, I mean at this point, I just want to win the game. Like I just want Whatever to win the it game. Takes. I want to get out. Of, I want to get out of Columbia and just win that game, and then show everybody up. I'm, I'm hoping a lot of people are going to be disappointed this weekend, outside fans. And then you'll go talk your shit again. Oh yeah, I'll be the keyboard warrior again for a minute. Even though I, even though I shouldn't, even though as a as an adult I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't, you know, be that guy. But yeah, you know, fuck it, man. Yeah, I know. All right, Jeb, <laughs> have a good night. Appreciate the rest. All right, later, man. Later. All right. Always fun to have Jeb on to close the night. All right, I close down the calls. But if anybody wants to get any points across through chat, like I said, I'll go a few more minutes with chat. Ooh, smooth camera flip. Let's see what you guys are saying. Who wants to bet on who starts? Hundred dollars read here. I think Reed's the overwhelming favorite. I don't think. I, I think right now it would make sense for Reed to be the first one out there. But again, we're reserving the right to switch quarterbacks if we have to, given the look the defense has given, given the success Reed has. I think it's. I would give Reed favorite odds in that scenario. Let's all remember to like and subscribe. Thanks, Red Seven. I appreciate you, man. I I love doing it. This is uh, something I honestly do pretty selfishly because I spend a lot of time consuming and thinking about Aggie football. And I figure why the hell not share it and bring people together and talk about it. So thank you. We'll get no credit for winning against South Carolina, but we'll get clowned for losing to them. Yep, that's been the case pretty much every week too. I think, I think we are getting our, fa our fair share of flowers this week, but obviously you're going to have those detractors given just this rivalries at sports. It's been a long time since we've broken through. We probably have to give the final push to, to get that full love. But, hey, we've always loved being the underdog. Are we going to love it when we get our flowers? I don't know. Casey says, Drew, let's talk about Dalton Brooks against LSU. Dude missed some pretty crucial plays. I know he's extremely talented. But he's got to clean that up this week. He missed some crucial plays early in the game, but he also made some really big plays later. I I. I don't have worries about Dalton Brooks going forward. I'm going to move this right on my forehead. It looks kind of silly. I don't have worries about him long-term because we've seen the body of work. I would argue he transformed our run defense. We saw it in the Arkansas game where he really had his first full game as a starter reps player because remember how he started the year with a string of targeting suspensions. And our running game has done nothing but improve since he got back into it because he dominates the flats. He is a missile to ball carriers and he makes the right choice makes the right angle first game where we saw him make some bad choices so i don't have worries about dalton at all and i'll also add to the safety conversation that i think we got bryce anderson's best game of his year and i think he was not himself this year so far i think the transition to safety hasn't been smooth so i don't have worries about safety going forward in fact i'm very bullish and i have been about the secondary. I think we're rated like 93 in pass defense, 93rd in the country in pass defense. Definitely bottom half SEC, probably bottom quarter SEC. Let's look at the totals. But I like what we have there. We're, we're forcing, we're giving up plays. We give up an explosive a game. We got to limit that. But we are forcing teams to take field goals. And that's a big deal as a defense, especially if you're able to score. Let me see. SEC team stat leaders. Let's see where we rank as a pass defense. Let me share this. So pass defense. Yeah, we're second to the bottom, but that's after giving up 400 yards. But you also gave up 27 rushing yards net. That's good. You take a one-dimensional approach. You take holding a team to 23. 
I, I think this this secondary is much better than this number would indicate, especially with the guys we have coming on like BJ Mays, Des Ricks, really important coverage moments in the game on some one-on-one -on -one deep shots. I, I, I like Dalton Brooks. Bryce Anderson has best game. I think there's a lot to like about the secondary outside of just the numbers. Good question, Casey. You got me to rant. Beat the hell out of South Carolina. What's up, Lash? Keep chipping away, 100%. I judge all my takes based on social media. Reed is posting a bunch of stuff on Insta. Connor went dead silent. Reed starts. That's some math right there. He's mathing it out. Who else is in saying things? Drew, who are the a &M haters in the media? Call them out. I don't know. That's not I, I'm not I'm not that guy. I'm not the guy that calls out other media people. I'm not a hot take guy. Y'all I'm sure y'all have noticed that. I, I just call it how it is. The hot take guys are the ones that are gonna piss you off, but that is their business model. Like uh this is the wrong camera. What's the guy y'all were talking about? The FYS sports guy? That's a hot take guy. That's a that's that's a talker. Um Paul Feinbaum is a hot take guy. That's how he gets his clicks, that's how he makes his name. At the highest level, Stephen A. Smith doesn't know ball. Hot take guy. That's how they get famous. We don't do that. So I'm not going to call them out for doing what, what they do to make their living. But they're there, and I don't like it. I talked about Brooks. We got him. We got Brooks done. We got Brooks done. A win against South Coast is another step forward. We're chipping away. Pounding the rock, as the Spurs say. Ags 38, USC 21. I would love it. Josh Pate picked against us again. LSU now USC. I love it. Doubt us, please. We need all the doubters we can get. 28-20. Ags fight off a very motivated South Carolina. We live stream the South Carolina game. Hell yeah, we are. Uh, 6 o'clock at the latest. We might go on earlier depending on the games happening before. 6 o'clock Saturday we'll be on. Brooks needs to be a water boy this week. Are we serious? Come on. He had good moments outside of the, that that big that big bus. A couple of big busts early. He gave up. Um, it was like a check down to a running back, and he gave up like a huge first down. Then he gave up the big touchdown. But dude, Brooks has been so critical to this defense. He really has. I believe we have an answer to a stack box with your quarterback. Reed's quickness is unreal. Connor, if he can throw the needle. Here's the thing: I see people defending Connor, and I, I agree. Connor has great stuff. It seems to be between the ears right now with Connor. It seems to be that he is pressing. It seems to be that he has residue from, from maybe getting hit, stuff like that. I don't know. You guys forget the people are young. Dalton and York, sophomores, people clown them for making mistakes. They're going to make mistakes. They're true sophomores. Yeah, look at York. Everyone was clowning him earlier in the year, and he just reeled off probably his three best games as an Aggie. I mean, give these guys time, 100%. Casey says, if you guys talked about BJ May, sorry I've joined so late. was super impressed what I saw by him. How about DJ Hicks? Yeah, we talked about them in quick. Huge story for BJ Mays, Incarnate Word here, local San Antonio guy, UAB, was always doubted, moved up to a and I think he had an injury in camp, Elko talked about, didn't see the field, was a corner, was buried behind a few good guys. Obviously, we like Des Ricks, we like Will Lee, Javen Thomas has a role. But then um, Tyreek Chappelle goes down, Elko talks about shuffling some guys over to nickel, he was clearly talking about BJ Mays, takes him a few weeks to work into the position, and now it looks like a hole in the defense is potentially a major strength of the defense. And huge credit for BJ Mays for staying the course. I mean, underdog story. Really, really cool stuff. And yeah, DJ Hicks is coming on. It's so critical for this team. Anyone mention how Edron Cooper's been a stud for the Packers this year? Yeah, he's huge, man. I think they're still limiting his reps, but he's making the most every time he's on the field. South Carolina O-line is indeed very bad. I think they're like rated under 100 in run in running attack, running offense. Uh, let's see where they are SEC wise. I don't want to throw numbers out there that are fake. Uh, let's share the screen. This is offense. Okay, so they're middle of the pack SEC running attack, and they're giving up a bunch. They've given up twenty three sacks on the year. We should be able to get after it. All right, I'll keep going with the chat. Y'all have to let me go to the restroom. I've been on for two hours. If I use the restroom, I'll come back and do 10 more minutes on chat, but y'all can't go anywhere. I'll be right back.
I left at 52 viewers and I came back to 52 viewers. Thank you guys. That's awesome. Yeah, we talked about that. Reed should start. I know. I think we're all pretty much leaning Reed. Most of us are. But I think we all reserve that we can trust this coaching staff to make the right choice, do whatever's going to work. But I would bet it's Reed. BJ Mays transforms this defense into an elite defense. I think so, man. It was the missing piece. It was a glaring hole. It's making a huge difference. And I thought um, Hill gave quality backup reps in the game, too. He tackled really well. How formidable is South Carolina's ability to uh, defend against a run offense? It's good, but I want to test it because they have a really, really athletic but smaller front seven. They get after quarterbacks. They force bad decisions. They've had some success stopping the run. I think let's check the numbers. They are third in the SEC in stopping the run. They're giving up 102 yards a game. For reference, a and giving up 104 yards per game. So they're right in line with us. But like I said, I think they're we're the best O-line they've probably gone up against on the year. And I want to see our big bodies who are improving every game. Adam Cushing is doing a great job with them. Improve on that. No, they've played, they've played LSU, but LSU does not run the ball, so it's not a good test. Uh, they played Alabama. They were pretty good at stopping the run against Bama, and I think that's a pretty good marker for them. Uh, looks like in that game they gave up only 104 rushing yards. So, yeah, it's going to be a good test, but I think we can be the team that gets the most running success on them given their th what their strengths are. David will call them out. I actually thought um, – Clat and Canell are giving us our flowers right now. Canell posted A&M greater than Texas. Clat just said that he's very happy for the A&M fan base who deserves this success. Feinbaum was blown away when he came to, Missouri, to the Missouri game a few weeks ago. He's blown away by the way this program has changed, the way the language around the building has changed. He was blown away. Murray, surprising, surprisingly negative takes, but I like Murray. Those takes were surprising. I don't really follow Doring, to be honest with you. I haven't heard any. Just folks very appreciative, uh, very apprehensive about the game versus South Carolina. Yeah, yeah. Even Joel Klatt, like I said, he's giving he's giving us flowers. He's saying that this fan base deserves what's happening. Aaron Murray took USC. Yeah, he did. He did not really respect A and M to the fullest coming out of the LSU game. He's maintaining that LSU blew that game. He thinks that if we played ten times, LSU comes out more often than not. And T Bob, who's his partner on the show, I love their show. I love Snaps. Um, was actually acknowledging that AM was the better team. He said that if they played 10 times, AM's winning more of those games. They'll have high respect for Reed's quickness and ability to read on zone read plays. The fiance is letting you live stream on Saturdays. Yes, she is. But like I said, the way we make it work, open door policy, she can come in anytime she wants. During the game, there's a couch on the other side of the screen. She was laying there eating ice cream. I was here screaming. It's a good time. She usually finds stuff to do. It's all good. Can we talk about the bye week effect? Teams are rusty coming out of buys. I feel like it negatively affects the favorite team, but it can positively affect the underdog. The underdog has this huge moment lined up for them that they're working towards. They're able to install wrinkles, off script stuff, stuff that hasn't been put on tape to catch the the favorite, you know, you know, um, not expecting that kind of thing. And I, I think it's definitely affected us. I think you, it was very evident coming out of Mississippi State, especially defensively, we had some rust. Um, I think for South Carolina, though, it's probably a benefit. Most likely, they're going to have some wrinkles. Their offense needed some work. Uh, I think we're going to see some offensive stuff from them. We're obviously going to see – expect at least one fake field goal or punt in the game. That's going to happen. Expect maybe an onside kick when you don't expect it. Expect the unexpected. They had time to work on that stuff. I think Bowling Green played us coming off of a bye, didn't they? And they had some stuff they showed us, and that gave us trouble. So I think it helps the underdog, hurts the favorite, hurts the, the more talented team. Drew, I think our defense is more opportunistic than your, stereotypical, than your stereotypical elite because we kill drives via sacks and picks rather than go for low yardage. They're your typical Georgia-Michigan SD. That's a good point. It's bend, don't break. It gets, it gets turnovers. It forces field goals. And I think it's still a work in progress. I think we're still seeing better performances week to week defensively. So... Let's see where it ends up, man. Huge opportunity to really stamp in this defense as potentially an elite one versus an offense that doesn't have a great offensive line. And that goes right where our strength is at. These Brooks haters are going to be shocked to hear that Brooks is our best run-stopping safety. I think he's our best, one of our best players, dude. 
I, I think the, I think the world of Dalton Brooks. I think that dude is a future NFL star. I think he's so good. Can you believe this is Elko's first year? All he has is a transfer portal, no recruiting. I know, and to establish the culture to the guys that were already here in a losing program, coach of the year, no question. As long as he gets, I mean, we don't want this. As long as he gets like eight, nine wins, that's a coach of the year. Can you believe we're at a, this is insane. Just coming to me right now. Can you believe we're at a point in the year where eight wins is a big disappointment? Even nine wins right now is a disappointment. How far we have come. Mike Elko, that's your coach of the year. We get a free quarter due to the bye, barring we give up special teams touchdowns. You think we get a free quarter? I don't know. We'll see. I hope so. I, I think if either team gets a lead in this game, it'll be hard for the other to come back. Obviously, I think we're better equipped offensively to do it, but I think leads will be hard to overcome given the defensive strengths in the game. Future is indeed awesome. Scooby and York are cooking. Sanford and DeShields are solid in the bench roll. Linebacker has come a long way, man. Everything's improving. You can't look at one aspect of this team and say it's not improving. Running backs have gotten better and better over the year. Amari is coming on. You know, receivers aren't getting chances, but I'll maintain they do get more separation than they get credit for. We just have to find the quarterback that can get them the ball. Defensively, all over the place, just skyrocketing. Improvement every single week. Dez is really getting better, absolutely. Big 210, hell yeah. The deuce dime. San Antonio. I believe Connor's issue is, uh, I also believe Connor's issue is mental, specifically his fear of being hit. I totally agree, man. Elko's talked about it. I think it's apparent. I think he gets sped up. It's just how it is. Those drops to the to the checkdowns early in the game to Noah, to, to Moss, yes, those were catchable balls. But Connor's throwing those balls really hard and really early in those routes. I, I You can catch them, but I put some of that on the quarterback too. I expect Aiden to get some turnovers in this game. I, we win the turnover battle. We win the game, and it is so on the table. I 100% agree. Just can't give it away. I'm happy BJ Mays took over for Hill. He was a clear weakness in coverage. Yep. Future is awesome. Recruiting is heating up with these big-time wins. Yeah, and we're, we're, we're trending really well for some 2025s now that decommitted from Florida State. One's a receiver. It's going really well. I think this is potentially, and I'll talk about this more when I drop my preview video. This is a game where we potentially break our sack record for the year. I really think it is. At least three. I'm with you. At least three in the game. Aggies 27, South Carolina t uh, 10. We get an early lead to the bye, and we pull away late in the game due to depth. I can see it, man. I think even the turnovers alone make me like Reed to start. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Both teams want to run, but a and D-line will body bag SC O-line and close that door. Marcel will keep their pass rush in check. South Carolina run defense is their defensive weakness. I hope we can make it a big weakness. Can we take a second to appreciate how we still have both quarterbacks at this point in the season? Thank you, Elko and Moffitt. Been, what, like three straight years with a hurt quarterback. Okay, yes, great point. They're both healthy. But I think even more impressively than that, they're both still bought in. I mean, think about the Allen Kyler situation. Think about this era of players where you get benched once and you're transferring. I mean, hell of a job to navigate this quarterback situation we have going on. Both these quarterbacks are fully locked in. Even when Connor got benched last game, man, he was cheering on Reed. He was the first one to go high five and hype up Reed, talk to Reed about what he's seeing coming off the bench. That's a hell of a job in itself. But also that the fact that they're not hurt, it's great. What do you think the ceiling of this team is? I think this is more of a conference championship run at playoff. If they play like they did in the second half defensively versus LSU and the offense can continue to progress, they can win a playoff game. They can win multiple. Look, do we really feel like this is a season where there are truly transcendent elite teams out there? Do we think Oregon's that? Do we think Ohio State's that? Do we think Georgia's that? Those are the three best teams. Do we think those are unattainable goals to, to at least win those games on a given Saturday? Now, I'm not saying you can go out and beat four of those teams in a row and win the whole thing. That's tough to do for anybody. But I don't see any team as unbeatable this year. I don't see Joe Burrow walking out of any tunnel. I, I don't see, you know, Bryce Young's Alabama walking out of any tunnel. I don't see uh, the Will Anderson defense coming out of any team. I don't see that this year. That's just me. It's early. Things can still develop. 
the ceiling is this team can win playoff games. That's absolutely the ceiling right now if you can build on what you've done, which is crazy, man. Can you believe that? You got to do it. You can still collapse. You have plenty of time to collapse. You got to get it done. Truffle shuffle with the 499. Get her gallons of ice cream ready. She was a good luck charm. Things weren't going well. She came in with some ice cream. And I said, keep eating the ice cream, babe. Keep eating the ice cream, honey. You're giving us some luck. Get that mint chocolate chip going. Make yourself a waffle cone. We have waffle cones in the building and mint chocolate chip, amongst other flavors. Keep it flowing. And this will add to the, to the ice cream fun. Thanks, Truffle Shuffle, for the 499. Really appreciate that. We'll do a few more before I get out of here. I think if we develop a passing game, which is asking a lot, the ceiling is national championship. That is the biggest hole on the team. We really just don't have a passing game. We can make passes, but we don't have a consistent passing game by any stretch of the imagination. And if you can add that huge glaring hole to a team, which is a lot to do in a month, 100%. 100%. We're as good as anybody. But that is a glaring hole in the team. That's the one. And Elko talked about it. He mentioned it. That's the deficiency of the team. It's the passing game. Mom's been waiting on me. Go watch Hocus Pocus, man. Have yourself some ice cream too, Jeb. Have a good night. Coach of the Year, Signetti. Oh, it's, it's going to be a tight race, man. It's going to be a tight. I think Elko gets it. I think Elko has the more high-profile stuff. I think in the SEC, they're gonna, he's going to get more eyes on him. Cignetti's doing a great job. I would, bet, I would bet Elko wins it over him. It just depends, though, how the rest of the year goes. It's, it's up in the air, right? But, yeah, he's definitely the other one in contention. I anticipate we win the special teams that hit a yardage battle this weekend. That'll be huge because that's what they want. If we win SEC, Elko's coach of the year 100%. The biggest green flag is we're improving on defense every week. Every aspect of the defense has improved every single week. Hassan says, you guys have made me believe that Reed is going to make better passing reads compared to Bowling Green. Well, yeah, I mean, he's a young quarterback. He's in a position to really improve every game. And Connor is too, but obviously we're dealing with mental stuff with Connor right now. And I think Reed is really, really good between the ears right now. Don't be paranoid. I try. Trust this staff. This is not a someone situation. That Tommy Moffat effect going to kick in the second half, 100%. I'm an Oregon believer, maybe Georgia. Agreed. When's the last time we were questioning legitimacy of OSU and teams like Indiana and Oregon have had easy schedules? Ohio State, they almost lost last week to Nebraska. And they're one loss away from falling out of this thing because they got to go win the game and then win the Big Ten Championship. And beat Indiana. They play Indiana this year. Ohio State has a tough path, man. It became tougher when Indiana came around. I don't know, man. That game versus Nebraska was scary for them. Georgia versus Texas is the best team I've seen play this year. Georgia was. Um, Georgia looked like the Georgia of old, except their offense had three turnovers, which someone could capitalize on. The defense looked as good as it's ever looked, didn't it? Michigan won last year, and they had a good D and a questionable pass game. That's a good point. It's a fair point. I don't think Indiana's beating OSU. They're going 11-1. and one. If Indiana beats Ohio State, Signetti's a coach of the year. What if that happens but Elko wins the SEC? Then it's tough. There's a lot to, there's a lot to happen this year still. It's early, and we're going to be happy in the position we're in. At South Carolina, at Auburn versus Texas, potential SEC championship. There's a lot to go. There's a lot to go, and we're very happy where we are. We're very happy with the trends and trajectory of the year. But we got a lot of football left. Guys, thank you so much for the long show. It's been a great time. I'll go live again later this week, probably Thursday night, maybe Friday night. I'll put an announcement out ahead of time. You will see. And then we'll be live for the watch party Friday, uh, Saturday night, 6 o'clock. And I will drop a full South Carolina game preview probably tomorrow night. Give you guys a couple days to watch that. I'm going to do some more scout and watch their games a little closer. Give some names to watch. Give some tendencies to watch. Some keys to the game. And we'll go from there. But guys, y'all have a great night. Thanks for being here. Gig them.